Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the June 14, 2022 regular meeting of the Pinehurst Village Council. Uh, this meeting will be followed by uh, a work session and a closed session uh, later in the evening. Uh, all of you who are here in the hall who might wish to speak during uh, public comments, comments from attendees at the end of this regular meeting, there is a list in the back of the room to sign, and if you would do so in the next few minutes, the clerk will uh, collect that list um, in a few minutes' time, and I'll work from that list when it comes time to hear your comments. If you are listening to this um, meeting through our live stream and you have comments for the Village Council, you can send those to an email address, publiccomments at vopnc.org, publiccomments at vopnc.org. The Village Clerk will receive those um, emails and the information will be distributed to members of the Village Council uh, and appropriate staff, but they won't be uh, read at this meeting. Having called the uh, meeting to order, the second order of business is get to the reports from the Village Council and the Village Manager, and I'll call on Mr. Sanborn to give his report. Thank you, John. I have nothing to report today. Okay. Uh, from my point of view, a couple of um, interesting... Uh, Activities over the last couple of weeks uh, on Memorial Day weekend, you'll be aware that the Sand Hills Motoring Festival again was here this year. It's become a, I think, a very extraordinary event for the village on a Sunday on Memorial Day weekend. Lots of uh, cars of all um, types, styles, ages, and uh, thankfully again this year, good good weather was held as well. Uh, however. Uh, as I'm sure many of you did too, the main purpose of Memorial Day weekend is to honor those who've sacrificed their lives for our country. And I hope uh, you, as many of us did, attended uh, memorial services uh, during that time. Uh, with respect to uh, my responsibilities with the USGA and the resort, obviously the Women's Open uh, provided a lot of opportunity to meet with some representatives of the USGA, talk about uh, our Pinehurst plans. And of course, uh, a week ago on Monday, the uh, groundbreaking for the USGA Golf House Pinehurst uh, was made. Um, they are looking forward to starting construction, I think, sometime in July. And hopefully that uh, building will progress and be ready uh, at the end of 2023 in preparation for the 2024 U.S. Open. Last weekend, I uh, had the opportunity to uh, get together with Representative Bowles um, on Saturday. Why would we get together on a Saturday? Well, we shared making the first pitches to the new Sand Hills Bogies baseball team that uh, is going to play its games out at the college. And uh, Representative Bowles and I had the luxury of uh, throwing pretty good, pretty good strikes to the to the catcher uh, to start that game. Uh, this team is uh, college-aged players. They play only in June and July. And it's a great bit of fun out there at the college. They have quite a, quite a schedule. They play several times a week. I would encourage you all to uh, entertain yourselves a bit with that uh, as that progresses. Uh, those are my uh, reports for this, uh, this day. And um, I'll start over here on my left today. Lydia, would you care to make any reports today? Yes, John, thank you. Um, from the CVB, um, from all appearances, the Women's U.S. Open was a tremendous success. They're waiting on economic data, and hopefully I'll have that by next meeting, but some things they wanted to report out. Um, ticket sales were 50% above the three-year three average of sales based on pre-COVID numbers, so that's a significant increase in the number of sales. And another, another thing that's pretty neat is 49 players in the field, and the field was about 150? Yes. 49 of those had come through U.S. Kids Golf. So that was a pretty cool number. So um, like I said, next, next month I may have some more numbers about the economic impact of the U.S. Women's Open in Pinehurst in, in the St. Hills. Thank you. Patrick? Uh, thank you. Just uh, one item. I had the opportunity uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago to attend the uh, Pinehurst Number 6 uh, Property Owners Association meeting. It was held right in this room. They had about mm -hmm. 75 people turn out. It was the first time I... Uh, attended their meeting, and I was very impressed, uh, one, with the turnout, two, with the uh, seriousness of the discussion that uh, was undertaken there. 
they had some representatives from the Pinehurst Resort and Country Club make a presentation um, about the, the adaptive open that's coming up, which I think is something that many of us will, will want to attend. I'll put in a plug. Uh, someone asked the question about tickets, and the tickets are free, so it's open to all. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say that other communities that have these type of meetings, I as a member of the council, and I think my colleagues also, if we've given, given a little notice, uh, probably like the opportunity just to attend and observe so we can learn something. I, I learned a lot at that meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Jane? Uh, thank you. Um, Pinehurst Business Partners will be holding its late till 8 uh, evening shopping um, Thursday evenings. The fourth, it's the fourth Thursday of the month throughout the summer. This was very popular last year, and um, look, they're looking forward to doing it again this year. So it will be June 23rd, July uh, 28th, and August 25th, and I hope everyone has a chance to go out and uh, do some shopping then and, and enjoy it. Thank you. Jeff. I've got nothing to report. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on then to uh, other council business and um, the motion to approve the consent agenda. I'm going to make a recommendation that um, the uh, inclusion there of the rescinding of defunct village council policies be pulled out. And some of us have been looking at those and have some questions we might want to address to uh, Doug Willardson, Jeff. So if it's acceptable to the rest of the council, I think we'll pull out item number C under the consent agenda for a later discussion and bring that back uh, at a later time. Would that be all right? I concur. Okay. All right. Jeff? What do you like to do is bring it back to a future I think all that needs to happen is probably in the next two weeks. Some of us can talk to Doug about some of the policies and yeah. how they might be carried on to other places already. Sure. And, if, and then we'll deal with that okay. at the time. Would that be all right? Yeah, sure. Good. Good. All right. So we're dealing then on a motion to approve the consent agenda, but only items A and B of that. Is there a motion, please? I'll move to approve all the items listed and considered routine in items A and B of the consent agenda. That's a motion by Jane Hogeman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilman Pazella. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. We'll move on to item number five. Extension of the Waste Management Services uh, contract in Pine Wild. All right. Thanks, John. We've got uh, both Mike Apke and Jeff, Jeff Batten com coming up to present this topic. Good evening. Um, Mike and I'll tag team this a little bit if we need to, but uh, for the most part, our uh, contract waste management expires June 30th. Um, this is a request to consider renewal of the solid waste services out at Pine Wild with waste management. Uh, the negotiated increase is a 5.3% increase. They have not received any increase in the last two years. Um, they started out at 8.49%. We would negotiate it down. Um, to this point. We think this is probably the, the best deal we're going to get uh, in a less than uh, competitive environment right now. Um, we are seeing shortages and we had every intention of bidding this out this year. Um, we actually had it prepared and ready to go. <clears throat> but with inflation running the way it is, uh, the fuel instability and shortages in carts, we just really did not feel this was an advantageous time to put this out to bid and could in fact have cost us even more uh, of an increase than what we saw because, frankly, waste management had a superior uh, advantage over everyone else in the fact that they have carts already deployed. As an example, the cart problem that we're running into, we've had carts on order in December and February that we have yet to receive with no definitive timeline of when they're going to get here. And so, we're, again, it didn't feel like that the uh, market was such that it that it was advantageous to go out to bid this year, but we would like to do that next year and get competitive bidding and see what, what comes forth. We did meet with the uh, property manager uh, in, I guess, early May. Does that sound right? Sounds right. Uh, talked about some of their concerns. Um, we have also reviewed uh, a spreadsheet of the, of the concerns that they have raised, uh, most of which are, you know, honestly, uh, I guess, uh, normal to a degree with solid waste services. They're the types of, of situations that we also encounter. Um, but uh, in any event, we would recommend that council consider uh, renewing uh, this service agreement with waste management for 
fiscal year 23, and then uh, we'll see what kind of bidding opportunities arise next year. Thank you, Jeff. When you say carts, you're referring to these big trucks. Just I'm referring to the actual pullout plastic yes. carts that you have, the cans. Oh, just trash cans. Oh, I'm, I'm yeah. wrong. I thought maybe you were talking about the big, the big recycling motor. and. Uh, and trash carts right now are very hard to come by and very hard to find, and we would need some 2,700 uh, for Pine Wild. And um, everybody's experiencing the same problem, waste management experiencing the same problem in, in ordering and receiving carts as we are. Trucks are even more hard to come by right now. We ordered our solid waste truck for this year uh, early July, and we don't anticipate it being here before the end of the fiscal year. So it's, it's over a year, uh, and we still haven't received our solid waste truck for this year. So shortages continue in a couple of areas and uh, aren't helping, but uh, we're getting around it. This did sound like, uh, to me, a, a pretty fair renewal and contract, Jeff, as you pointed out tonight and in your memo. Very, uh, very well done. Are there questions of counsel uh, for Jeff or Mike Apke on this subject? Patrick? When <clears throat> was the contract last negotiated? How, how many years has it been in place? The previous amendment was a two-year arrangement, if I recall correctly. And, and how long has waste management been provided? They are the original providers of the that, What does uh, original mean? Waste, meaning they were the original at the time of annexation. So, so 2014, it, 13, 10. 12. Yeah, the original contract that we had with them was 2010, I believe. 2010. And there's, this would be the sixth amendment to that. Yep. They've been the provider for 12 years, and it's never been rebidded at all during that period? Um, I don't think it has been. I can't recall that it has been. Uh, we were going to, as I said, put it out this year. We actually had the RFQ put it ready to go to go out, or RFP, I should say. But do they have, does Waste Management have other contracts with the Village of Pinehurst? They do not. Pine Wild is the only uh -huh. service agreement. And is there any other, any other community within Pinehurst of which there's a contract for waste removal? There are. Yes. Uh, the Country Club of North Carolina has two uh, much smaller uh, for lack of a better term, mom and pop operations out there um, that provide those services. Those have been long term also uh, in place for long term. In fact, the annexation agreement uh, with CCNC coming in sp specifies that we cannot provide solid waste services with our own forces in there unless they vote 75 percent vote in favor of the village providing our own uh, solid waste collection services. Basically, what you've got is some family, old families that have been servicing in there for a long time. So there's obviously not a similar provision in the Pine Wild Agreement then? No, sir. Not voluntary. When, when Pine Wild was originally annexed uh, into the village, there were, I think, three approved solid waste providers out there. The village, when taking over Pine Wild, put it out to bid at that time and elected to use one uh, service provider for the entire community. How much lead time will we need next year in order to have a contract out in, in time for a bid and negotiation process? We probably would put something out late winter. I think to, to be uh, the preparation to make a switch is pretty significant when you sure. think about flipping out 900 homes of uh, with the, the various trash carts, recycled carts, etc. Are, are the carts the property of Pinewild? Pinehurst or the property waste management? Waste management. They are. Yep. Thank you. Other questions? Just Lydia? one comment. I know you guys know this, but I want the public record to show that Pinewall really appreciates how responsive you guys have been. You thank couldn't, you. You couldn't do you. any better in responding to their concerns. So thank you. Uh, Jane or Jeff Morgan, any questions? Seeing none, uh, is there a motion then to uh, approve this extension. I move to authorize the mayor as designate, designate to execute a one-year extension to the contract with waste management with a negotiated increase of 5.3 percent in annual value at approximately $270,000 effective July 1, 2022 and expiring on June 30, 2023. That's a motion by Councilmember Bosch. Is there a second? A second. A second by Councilmember Hogeman. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, that carries. Mike and Jeff Batten, thank much. you very much for your thank time you. on that. Move on to item number six.
Jeff? Thanks, John. Another contract renewal uh, suggestion or uh, request for you. Um, and Jason's going to present this topic. This is for our Excella um, software that we use for primarily for our permitting and in, in, uh, our planning inspections department. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. Um, it's that time of year to, uh, to consider a lot of renewals, but Excel is, is one big one for us. And Excel, of course, you probably know is, is the software, the, the land management, the civic platform that we use for our permitting and inspections. Of course, Darren's department, he's not, they're not the only department that uses this. So we use it across the village, but it's time for the renewal. And their invoice that they, the renewal rate that they want this year um, is a 7% increase than last year, and they have told us that on average it's 7% going forward. So um, they offered us a 3%, what they call uplift each year if we do a five-year agreement with them. So um, that's what we're here for today to uh, ask you if, if you would approve that so we could lock in. Over that five years, we will save approximately a little over $33,000 by going to this five-year agreement. And I've talked to Darren. He's on board with it. Uh, we've been using this software since July of 2019. It's working well. We're still making it better. It can do almost anything. It's just a matter of how to make it do that, right? So performing well for us, and we'd like to renew if, uh, Jason, who is that you reviewed it with? I didn't hear the name. Darren. With Darren himself. I thought maybe you were referring to another yes. person. We know Darren is heavily using that. Okay. Um, so it looked like at one point they were looking for 7%. But we ended up with three. If we do the five-year agreement, we can get the 3% instead of the seven each year. It is a five-year agreement, roughly fifty to 60000 over the term, I think, is the increase as I, as I saw them. 50-something to about 60, 62. Right. If we do the five-year agreement at the 3%, this year is a little over 50000 In five years, it'll be a little over 56000 Okay. All right. Uh, has the village attorney looked at this contract as a five-year deal, which wasn't our original? He looked at the original agreement that we have with Excella, and all this is is just a renewal on top of that, referring to the previous agreement that we have with them. But I have not sent him the actual agreement. Um, I think I'll throw Brooke out there. I know she's looked at it, and everything looks standard to you. All right. Do you think we need to have Mike look at this since it's a five-year contract, or are we all right with that? Yeah. He'll review the contract, yeah. If, okay. All right. So I think we'll move to a motion, understanding that Mike Newman will give this a okay. review sure. before I sign it and send it away. Any questions from council? I have one question. Um, a five-year contract, and with changes in technology, and you just said something like, we can try to make it better. If we, if we want improvements to the software, do you make them? Do they make them? Is there, my concern is if you lock yourself into a five-year package, are you stuck with the technology that's there for five years? Or if you need improvements, is it possible to make improvements? And who makes those improvements? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I'll try to make it uh, an answer very simple for you. Um, they make improvements themselves yearly, no matter if it's for Village of Pinehurst or City of High Point or whoever. So they're constantly improving the software. They, it's cloud-based, so they update that for us. They, they let us know when they provide these updates and what the new features are. But as far as the system goes, the system can do uh, has a tremendous amount of features. And to make those features work, we have to tell the system we want to use them. Uh, some scripting and other things are involved. And to do that, we have to do that or contract with someone to help us do that. So that's what we're working on now. We do have one person on staff that's, that works with us. That's fine. It's technology at work right now. <laughs> yeah, so um, we can make some improvements ourselves. And there are all the, all the time ongoing improving the software um, as well from the back end standpoint. Okay, so, but we're not losing any efficiency by locking ourselves into five years? I wouldn't think so. Uh, this is probably one, of, I would say it's a premier product out there. We, uh, we investigated heavily when we purchased this, went through the whole birdie process, and uh, it came out on top above everyone else. So um, it is being used by a lot of people, a lot of governments, even in North Carolina. Um, so we would, we lock into five-year agreement. We, 
we totally expect that to be a, a, a good deal for us. In five years, we would look at it and decide if we still want to, okay. to move forward or not. Okay, thank you. Other questions from council? Pat? Yes. Uh, does any other community in Moore County use Excella as a civic pipeline? I do not think so. Uh, the county uses something different. I'm not sure what they use. Um, and I know Southern Pines uses something different as well. Okay, so we're, we're, we're the only ones pretty much in Moore. How about elsewhere in North Carolina? Yes, um, there are several, but uh, City of High Point's familiar to me because we worked with them when we purchased it closely to see how they liked it and how they used the system. So I know that City of High Point uses it, and there are others. I, I do have some notes that we, we talked to some other folks when we purchased this. Just to remind me, in the memo cites the village performed a birdie, and I know that's I'm not talking about one under par. What, what does that mean? That we yeah, so a basically that is just a, uh, a nice way of relating Pinehurst to project management through the birdie process. It's just something we developed back in the days preparing for the Baldridge um, going through that Baldrige achievement process. And so basically the birdie team is set up. Uh, we set up, we had, of course, a lot of the team members that were here then are not now, but uh, consisted of the planning department. Um, Mayor, Mayor Fiorello was on there as well, as well as some of the um, realtors and construction folks in the community. So there was probably 10 people on that birdie team when we went through this selection process. The birdie process is, a, is our formal our most formal evaluation process and you know, we, we spent a lot of time in that in that framework defining the problem and then in laying out possible solutions and evaluating those solutions it's linked to baldridge right linked to the baldridge process uh, well i mean it, it it helps with our baldridge framework but it's not something that's associated with baldridge oh it's not okay uh, have the last four years or three years of the contract with Excella, have they been uh, renewed annually, or is that a three-year contract? How did that work? It's been renewed annually. So we have a we've had a one-year contract with them for about four years, and now we're about to enter into a five-year renewal. That's correct. That we're not competing. Um, you know, it, it gives me a, a, a little pause. I, I definitely want to want the council to review it. Uh, it's not like the, the one we heard before on waste management. It's a one-year renewal. Uh, so the village will have another shot at it in a year. In this regard, with, particularly with this package, there, are, there would be significant organizational costs associated with changing providers. Well, I'm not going to rip this whole software framework out of our, out of our staff operating processes and put plug something else right. in. So it, that would be a significant... I guess what, what I'm really debating is, is it wise to go for five-year renewal rather than a one-year renewal? Five-year renewal is a, is a right. major commitment of a, of a, and that, that's a contractor that we haven't competed with in four years. That's what I'm trying to address with you here is that um, given the, the cost and energy associated with changing providers, it makes more sense for us to have a long-term solution anyway. And we save money by doing it on a five-year plan that's at 3% versus risking the 7% over 7% over 7% annually. Yeah, the way I was looking at it was that um, we've got, what, three, almost really four years, or is it it's three years, I guess, right now of experience this is a leading provider as i understand it which went through quite a period of, of uh, review as you mentioned jason and um, as village manager said there's significant financial benefit to us to go to the five years given the increases at three percent that would occur and i'm sure there's some sort of a termination clause in the contract um, that would allow either party to cancel or with, with some it's under some arrangements after 30 days or, or some such thing. So I would, I would think that would be the way that if something wasn't going right, we would have a, the ability to, uh, to terminate that. And I, I did talk to Darren, too. I just wanted to make sure that he was okay locking in with yeah. the five-year agreement as well. And, and he, he was good with that. We talked through several scenarios and, and, and feel like we we'll definitely need five more years to really determine, you know, Darren, would you and like to speak to the this. issue here and, and remind me, us exactly all the things you're doing with this? 
Yeah, let, let me jump in just a little bit here, and I, I understand where, where Patrick's uh, coming from with, with the, you know, we're getting into a five-year deal, and it seems like a long-term contract, I mean, relatively long-term contract. The issue with a, a system, and Jeff was getting to it, uh, it's a very complex system and requires a lot of training from our staff. So I have 10 people that are trained to use this system. So if we flip out to another potential, there are other users out there, but that then sets up another set of another set of training. So I have, they have to get adapted to that new training. It took that new system. It took us a good, I don't know, a year, year and a half to get comfortable with that system. And we're just getting, <laughs> we've been into it now. We're, we're getting comfortable with the system. There's still things that we need to adjust. But if we get into the process of and then all of our records, I don't know how all of our property records are stored, how all our permits are stored. So while I understand the concept, in practice, in, in, in theory or in reality, the way the, the impacts on staff by changing ever, so frequently would, I think, would be a setback for our staff members. And I'm, I'm speaking for the planning and inspections where we all use it. I don't, you, I don't know who else all Public use services, it. Public fire. services, fire. And it would have the same impact on our customers. And, yes. Thank you. Uh, other questions? <laughs> Council? Jeff? Jane? Ready? All right. Uh, Darren, thanks for adding to the conversation. Jason, thank you. Anything else you'd like to add to the uh, comments? No, sir. That's good. All right. Uh, we need a motion then to uh, approve or not this uh, extension. I'll move to authorize the mayor or his designee to execute a five-year renewal contract with Excella Civic Platform for permitting and inspection software at a starting cost of $50,346 that increases at a rate of 3% per year, effective July 1, 2022, and expiring on June 30, 2027. That's a motion by Council Member Hogeman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member uh, Morgan. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, we approve that. Jason, thank you very much. Thank you. Move on to uh, item number seven, right. Mr. Sanborn. I, th I think I'll be taking this one, John. Uh, okay. D. Johnson's term uh, as the chairperson of the Beautification Committee is coming to an end, uh, and we have a resolution prepared for your consideration to, to, for you to appoint Janet Farrell uh, to be the next chairperson of the Beautification Committee. J Janet is the kind of the the obvious choice, given the fact that she's she's kind of shared in those chairperson responsibilities over the last year or so, so um, it's there for your consideration. Uh, is there any discussion or questions about this uh, nomination? I think hearing none, is there a motion to approve this uh, nomination of Janet Farrell as the chairman of the Beautification Committee? I'll move to approve Resolution 2208, appointing Janet Farrell as Beautification Committee Chair for a two-year term beginning July 1, 2022 and expiring on June 30, 2024. Thank you. That's a motion by Council Member Hogeman. Is there a second? Second. A second, mem second by Council Member Pizzella. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That is approved. Thank you very much. Jeff? And then next up, uh, we have a resolution prepared for you to reappoint uh, Sonia Rothstein to both the Planning and Zoning Board and the Board of Adjustments. Right. For a second term. Right. Uh, I noticed that the chair of the Planning and Zoning Board is here. If we have any questions about that. Uh, Jeremy, would you like to qu quickly come to the uh, podium? Unexpected, but called on. Take advantage of your being here. Um, yes, sir. I recall uh, no nominating Sonia a few years ago, and I know she's been active on the board. Um, any comments you'd like to make in support of this? Of course, I definitely support it. You know, Sonia has a unique perspective from our board that would that would be voided if she was not reappointed. But it's not a unique perspective from our community. There's a lot of people who really feel the same way as Sonia and have a lot of the same type of responses. So I believe that um, a reappointment to her would, in essence, be a continuance of that voice on our board. Thank you for that. Are there questions uh, of Mr. Hooper or anyone else with respect to this nomination? Renomination. Seeing none, is there a motion? Yeah, I'll move to approve resolution 22-16, reappointing Sonia Rothstein to the Pinehurst Planning and Zoning Board and the Board of Adjustment for a July 1, 2022 term that expires on June 30th, 2024. 
That's a motion by Council Member Pazella. Is there a second, please? Second. Second by Council Member Bosch. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Congratulations, Dolphin, Jeremy. Thank you. thank you. Mr. Sanborn, item number nine. All right, thanks, John. Uh, Brooke's on her way up. She's got three topics to cover with you to, tonight. Uh, the first is pursuant to a policy that was adopted by council, I think, a little over a year ago, um, uh, with regard to what to do with year-end fund balance that exceeds 40%. That's right. Thank you. So the cat various categories of fund balance were established in the Governmental Accounting Standards Board Statement Number 54. And that statement basically lists out the various categories of fund balance, and it lists them from most restrictive to least restrictive. And we've talked about these various categories before, but I'll quickly run through them. Non-spendable is the most restrictive category. It's items like inventory that you just cannot spend. It's not in a cash form. And uh, the next category would be restricted fund balance. And those um, items are restricted by external sources. So federal government, state government, um, donors, or something like that. Something that the unit cannot change. The next category is committed. And that would be committed by the government's highest decision-making authority. So in our case, council as the highest decision-making authority for the village. The next category is assigned, and those are just items that would be intended to be used for a specific purpose. And the last restrictive category uh, is unassigned, which can be used for anything. So the village's fund balance policy was recently amended on February 9th of 2021, and that was under Resolution 21-03. And one of the changes that was made at that time included a provision that allows council to commit a percentage of fund balance for future capital if our fund balance at year end exceeds 40% of actual general fund expenditures. And so just to give you a bit of history on that, um, at the, um, the council budget retreat in December of 2020, council expressed a desire to, uh, or an interest in saving and setting aside funds for future capital that had been identified in the five-year planning period as well as outside of that and beyond. So that was, this was the chosen mechanism. Sorry. That, this was the chosen mechanism to commit a portion of fund balance for future capital uh, with the intent to save. This is an optional step in the process per the policy. It does say may if you, if you see that. So this is um, something that council has the option to do. This commitment would take place in the form of a separate resolution each year, which is before you tonight, to ensure that a clear trail is in place of Council's intent to commit those funds for future capital. So in order to commit fund balance for a fiscal period or for a fiscal year, the action has to take place before year end. Um, and so that is why you'll see the language in this resolution is in a calculation type format because we don't know those exact numbers yet or where fund balance will end until we work through the audit process and we write the financial statements. Uh, the calculation will occur after year in, after our audit, as I mentioned, and it will be reported in the annual comprehensive financial report. That's your financial statements. Um, I have attached to the agenda item um, an example of last year's calculation, just so you could see what it looked like before, what it looked like after the calculation was in place, and after the commitment occurred. Nothing is being taken out of total fund balance. The total fund balance are still, is all included in uh, various categories. If you look at the totals from one scenario to the next, it's the same. It's just how it is categorized based on how council um, likes to separate those items and split them out. So resolution 2215 is presented for your consideration, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have related to it. Thank you very much, Brooke. Um, uh, well, I'll just ask this question to start off. Um, what we're doing is we're setting up the process according to the policy we adopted before to make a contribution because it looks like to capital, because it looks like we're going to have more than 40% at the end of this fiscal year. Now, I, I may have missed it, but what's, what's the number roughly we think we will have that's going to be taken and put over into capital? 
that's the piece I'm not sure yet, because that is, that's the element that I'm, I won't know until we completely finalize the financial statements. Well, a ballpark. I mean, a it, well, there's currently $4 million in there. There's currently $4 million. A substantial I, I anticipate number. that it would increase yeah. from last year, just right. based on some of the funding we've received. Um, but I don't know that exact number yet, because it will depend on how many projects are completed by the end of the year, how much we're able to, uh, to finalize by June 30th, um, versus how many things we're going to have to roll over into the next year that won't impact, uh, that, that will cause fund balance to be higher at year end because we won't have a chance to spend it by June 30th. There's just a lot of factors at play until we finalize our projects for the right, fiscal I, year. As we've gone through the process of adopting this policy over the last year or so, you've been good about explaining the ins and outs of that equation and, and all the flexibility we need to have for that. But nevertheless, there's a substantial contribution that will, I'll call it a contribution, coming uh, at the end of the fiscal year at some point. Okay. Once we get that number, I can do that calculation, we'll be bringing it back to you in July. We did, we did that last year, right? Right. Well, we yeah. will share that information with you. That's right. So you, you would take action today, if, if so choose, um, and because the action has to occur before June 30th in order for it to be considered a commitment in that fiscal year. And that's just because of the GASB uh, accounting requirements. The action has to happen beforehand. Uh, but it, it does allow you to set... Um, use a calculation as uh, the basis for that commitment so that you can wait until after the year closes and you finalize all those expenditures for the year before you calculate that number. So we're not just guessing, if you will, right now at where it'll land. Uh, it allows you to actually have a, a firm number once it's finalized. But as soon as we know that, I'll be happy to share that information with you. What we know now is that if you prove it, that, that if you approve this, then the end result after we go through the year end would be the fund balance would be taken down to 40 percent. If anything, right, anything over, anything, right, anything over 40 percent of uh, the general fund actual expenditures would be committed for future capital. Right. That's right. And it, but the other element to that is in no case may that commitment cause your unassigned general fund fund balance to drop below the 15 percent that is also in your policy right. to make sure that you at least have 15 percent available for your operations and whatever you need. Right. Now, the, uh, is, is, um, there's really two things in everybody's mind. One is, at least in my mind, what's the number going to be? You've explained how to, um, you know, the ballpark number for that um, that we should do. And then the issue of how we manage the fund balance and the policy and all that. And I think others have questions along those lines for you tonight. So we'll continue on that. Pat, did you want to continue? Yeah, I have some uh, questions. I'm, uh, I'm sure we'll get a good and accurate number when you have the number, so I'm not going to pursue that. I want to follow up, follow up a little bit on what Jeff alerted uh, alluded to. The 40% number, the 30% number, uh, what we're saying is we have an excess of the 40% number, which is our policy, right? We want to have between 30. I thought we the our policy is between 30 and 40 percent. Policy now just has the minimum of 30 percent. Correct. There's no 40 percent, so we got it wide open. But we're saying it's going to be in excess of 40. Excess of 40 percent of actual. So there are two different calculations here. The 30 percent is 30 percent of budgeted expenditures at the beginning of the year. So that's at our planning time when we're preparing the budget for the upcoming year, and you're looking at the five-year forecast. You know, we're setting a budget that will ensure that we keep at least 30 percent of fund balance, uh, total fund balance on uh, budgeted expenditures. Uh, the 40 percent is based on actual expenditures at the end of the year. So the actual versus projected, we are in excess constantly of that number. We are usually in excess of the 30 percent. Yes, per yes, because based on policy, we have established a budget that ensures that we 30%. are at least 30 percent. So we're, and in, we, it sounds like we are often in excess of 40 percent. Right. We have, we of course prepared the calculation I understand. this one year and it was, it. and I think we did a, a historical calculation for like a three year period and, and one year it decreased when we built the community center or something like that. You know, we, uh, for known changes like that, just to, just to say, let's say this policy were in place for the past three years, we evaluated what the impact would have been on the financial statements those years. Well, this brings me back to the, the issue I, I've raised before about I think our policy of 30% is too high. 
I just think we're, especially as we're entering an inflationary period, we are husbanding cash. And uh, I think it'd be the wiser cash, ma cash management if we reduce that a little. Uh, and we'll still, uh, I will predict that we're still gonna have in excess of whatever we reduce it to, simply by the nature of our ability to predict because in these changing times, things change. No one's looking for, you know, if you were, could predict everything perfectly, you probably would be sitting in a much bigger office. But, but uh, so I, I'm not expecting that. But I do think it, it, what we're, we're seeing is a, a, a pattern, not a bad pattern. <laughs> it's not like we're getting in trouble. Uh, but it's a pattern that has us with an excessive, in my mind, amount of cash laying around. And I think if we reduce our, our policy numbers a little, we'll have a little less cash. And we'll still have money for future capital expenditures. And we'll still have uh, uh, a cushion so that we don't, we don't have to panic from, from a management or cash flow standpoint. So um, that, that's the problem I have with these, these numbers, it, not, with, not particularly with the resolution. I mean, I, I want to see us be able to go forward and manage. I'd like to speak up. And yeah, I want to see us be able to go forward and manage uh, you know, efficiently. Uh, but I do think we should make some uh, adoption of something that tightens things up a little. There just seems to be a little more cash lying around than I think we should have. Thank you. You know, uh, this is still a relatively new policy for the village. Um, and I recall it being set, um, and there's, you know, there's an equation which is working there. And we got tax rates on the one hand, we got capital expenditures on the other, and what we see coming into the future is a lot of demands on capital expenditures out in the next several years. So to me, to be, to be erring on the side of a little stronger fund balance um, uh, may be a good thing, and it's a savings account for us into the, into the future. Now, on the other hand, we have debt capacity as well. We don't need to, um, and we could consider that as we go forward. But um, I don't know how the rest of the council, we're dealing with two things here tonight. One is the discussion about making this um, resolution to um, carry the, uh, take, the for, take the funds over the 40% at the end of the fiscal year. But um, some of us may want to talk about the overall policy in a little more detail. Yeah. So I mean, you're kind yeah. of, your conversation is about two related yeah. but Correct. different things here. I think, I, I think Patrick pairs. agrees with that. But you know, whether you approve this or not, we're still left with the fund balance. The question is, do you want to dedicate some of it to future capital and, yeah. or, or leave it as more, more to, to be more flexibly used? I, I certainly feel that we ought to go ahead and approve this request and get that done by the fiscal year end so that we're in a position to do the things we want to do. But the issue of how the fund balance works and the appropriate levels, as Pat and maybe others are raising, is something we can discuss. It, and and this, this action, if you approve it, is something that you could undo by a similar action in right. the future. It's you know, more of a right. what, one other question. statement what is, of intent than anything else. Yes. What's the distinction as to our ability to make decisions about this excess money, whether we put it into this capital bucket or we just leave it in unassigned funds? I mean, to me, I don't, I don't see a, a, an accounting difference. Am I missing something? Uh, it's not huge. I, I, think that we, we, I think that when the council made this decision previously, it was just about making us a statement that we, we we have these funds and we want to say that we are we are dedicating this and for future capital needs because we know we have these big capital requirements on the horizon. Jeff and Brooke. In practice, like as I said, you could take this action now and you could you could undo it a month from now. <laughs> um, or you could not take this action now and you could do it. <laughs> A month for the next now. year. That's right. That's, for well, next year. that's a little bit what I'm third. getting at yeah. is that the money is almost is fungible as to what we do with it. We're deciding whether to put it in this bucket and saying we'll you use it for some capital expenditures or we're going to leave it in this bucket and we'll figure out what we're going to do with it otherwise. Yeah. Okay. 
but somebody refresh my recollection. It seemed like there was an alternative where we could put it into some capital account and it had to stay there. We couldn't touch it again. Yeah. That's this was, so that was an option. That's correct. But we chose this just to, so you could look at the balance sheet and see how much had been set aside for capital pur pur purposes, but we also could take it out of there if we didn't. It was just, it was just a clearer picture on the balance sheet. That's all. Correct. That's correct. The capital reserve fund is the other option that you're referring to. But once funds are moved over to the capital reserve fund, they have to be used for capital. They cannot be pulled out and used for operating in the event of an emergency. If you uh, commit them in this manner, you have full flexibility to move it out as needed for emergencies or whatever. Do, the do, we ha do we have any funds in the capital reserve account? We do not have a capital reserve fund. We, we do not have one. No, this is a, this is a startup time. Yeah. We don't. And it's being... Well, it's being um, um, encouraged right now or required because we have a number of projects, the library being one and other things going on that uh, we know we're going to need. And that statement is, um, was just made as we, this selection, as Lydia was pointing out, gives us the flexibility to move that around wherever it needs to be. If it was com in a committed account, or I'll get the name right, it, had to be, it would have to be spent for Capital. street lamps or whatever else, fire trucks, whatever else. This gives us flexibility. It's a commitment, as Jeff was saying, that we have these capital expenditures in the future. We're setting some monies aside now to take care of that. We can talk about the appropriate levels of the fund balance over time in this policy, but I think it's important we adopt this tonight. Are there other questions of uh, Brooke? I have a question. Yes, Jane. So this year we have the one-time $5.3 million American Rescue Plan windfall if and we're using part of that for the make ends meet money instead of taking that out of what would have been otherwise general fund that's part of what we're doing with that but if we were to take the american rescue plan money and set it over to the side because it is a windfall that came out of nowhere would we still be solvent and everything so the ARP funds that you're referring to, you're right, we've received half of that. It's currently sitting in the Amer American Rescue Plan Act Special Revenue Fund. As of June 30th, 2022, it's still going to be sitting in the Special Revenue Fund. Um, so it is not going to affect the decision that you make here tonight for this resolution. This is specific to the fiscal year 22 fin financial statements. Okay. So the plan is, to your point, in fiscal year 23 to balance the budget, if you will, with that money from the American Rescue Plan Act and funnel those funds in. So that the first year that we're really seeing that money come into play in the general fund will be in fiscal year 23, so next fiscal year. Would be okay. Those dollars would be eligible for this decision That's right. at this time next year. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. Thanks. That help? Yeah. Uh, are there other questions? Is the council ready to vote? Uh, is there a motion then? I move to approve resolution 2215 to commit excess funds to the fund balance for future capital as of January, thir excuse me, June 30, 2022. That's a motion by Lydia Bosch. Is there a second? Second. Second by council member Hogeman. All in favor say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Uh, Brooke, thanks again for your good explanations. Move on to item number 10. Mr. Okay, Sambo. So now we've got the <clears throat> FY23 budget. Uh, it's yes. been a long process. I always say this is a year-long process, and, and here we are. This is uh, the opportunity for the council to adopt the FY23 budget. Um, been a lot of activity over, on, on this front over the last 30 to 60 days. Uh, for everybody's um, awareness that wasn't here to participate in that process. We presented the budget to the, to the, uh, the, the council and the community in early May. Uh, council had some work sessions uh, around the middle of May to, to look at some, some of the details. Uh, we had the opportunity for the, a public hearing at your last council meeting, uh, the second meeting in May. Uh, and this is your first opportunity to consider approving and adopting the budget for FY23. If there's some concern that you have, we, we do have the fallback to come to bring it back to you at your next meeting, but mm -hmm. it does have to be adopted before July 1st. Right, right. Um, well, first of all, other questions from council? <clears throat> that, well, the only question I had is that we, we had an inquiry from a, a citizen regarding uh, 
um, a position yes. in the archives. And uh, um, I thought it was a, a good point that was raised. I don't know why within the budget as it is right now, we have to designate those specific FTEs to be for positions that are not an archivist position. Unless, unless I'm reading the budget wrongly, in the budget we have a number of FTEs that we placed in. Are those FTEs specifically described by a position or are they a number of FTEs for the uh, archives and library? So in fiscal year 23, all the positions have, they've been hired because they were hired in fiscal year 22 with the transition. They're not vacant positions. They're not, not in fiscal year 23. However, there are a couple of positions planned in an out year for the library once the expansion occurs, and those positions have not been specifically named. Um, I'm not sure I understand Patrick's question, but I, I think what you're asking is, do, you have, do we have flexibility to apply the two FTEs that are in this, additional FTEs that are in this budget to other purposes? Yeah, within the library. Within the library world, of the library and the archives. Oh, so that, that's... Yes, that's, that's the two, simplified. Method. So this budget contemplates adding two FTEs, they're police officers. The rest of the hired of the library staff has already been hired in FY22, so there's no flexibility to change that. Okay. So if we were going to get position specific, it would need to be in FY23. If Which we we're about to enter. Yeah, at this point, for all practical purposes, any, point, any decision you make would have to be in FY23. If you made a decision to add an FTE, you could always do, we could always do a budget amendment to do that. Mm -hmm. Specifically, the, the request has been for an archivist. Yeah, archivist. So, yes. so somebody to oversee the archives. Do we have somebody now in the position that some in the community think is a, a very valid position for the library? Well, um, we, our, our library and archives department has not voiced this concern to us. Okay. We saw this concern for the first time, I think, in the last 24 hours. Okay. So okay. Let, us, let us ask the question. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I, it's a good question to ask. Uh, and uh, I would, uh, uh, I, I for one wouldn't object if we were to uh, uh, provide other duties to one of those uh, positions that we now have in place to take on some archives responsibility. They, they uh, are intended to be dual purpose, library and archives associates, as, as they are currently hired. Library and archives associates, that's actually in the, tit in the position title? Uh, that, that, that sounds accurate. <laughs> Is that right, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that. Thank you. So Jeff Sanborn, it sounds like the next step is to talk to Audrey and get Audrey's take on this. Okay. Well, I think Doug Willardson's been looking after that too. Would he not, or is Jeff? There's been a on the personnel. A stated request for somebody to handle the archives, and it sounds like from what you're saying is we didn't hear that from the library. But the next step would be to find out if the library. I mean, what's the library? What's Audrey's position on whether she needs I, that? I guess the more complete answer is that we have gone through this transition period. We've had a very lengthy discussion. Okay about the appropriate staff structure for what we have. Okay. And we all were in agreement on the staff structure that we hired this year. Okay. There has been, we have not heard the concern that we heard from a resident in the last 24 hours from the staff. Okay, that, that's, that's the answer to my question. Yeah. Do I recall, Jeff Sanborn, too, that um, it, it seems certainly in the first fiscal year, maybe in the first several months of the new fiscal year, once we had taken responsibility for the library and the archives, part of the work of the village staff in now working with our new staff in the library and archives was what are the needs of the library on the one hand and what are the needs of the, of the archives on the other? And to have some time to evaluate from our full point of view what the, what the, what the staffing and responsibility and and technical skill levels might be going forward. Yeah, we're going to learn as we that's go. Where we this are. is new yeah. for us. I think that's what you're saying. Yeah. 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 We have some learning to do, and uh, uh, it's the intention to um, 
continue to grow and improve the archives just as it is the library. And we needed time to figure this out a little bit further. I, I, I think it's vital going forward. We don't have to do it right now. We don't have to change anything. That we have an archivist. For the Tufts archives. Yeah, and I, I think I, during I, the discussions I, I, we had, that was covered. Yeah, yeah you're right. I, I think that's vital, and uh, we'll be looking forward to that in the future. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay. Uh, so uh, we need to. Let's see. Where are we? Number ten. Okay. I move to still approve uh, ordinance twenty two. We still have a motion to do. Jeff? Opting FY 2023 budget of the Village of Pinehurst. Any discussion? And is there a second? Second. A motion to adopt the fiscal 2023 budget for the Village of Pinehurst. There's a second by um, a second. Shane Hogeman, yes. Motion by uh, Jeff Morgan. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much, Brooke. We have a budget for the new fiscal year. Thank you very much for your time on that. And Brooks got one more topic to yep. cover with you, and that, that is uh, the uh, the request to have you open the capital projects fund uh, by ordinance for the library and archives expansion. Uh, and the, the first funds that would be flowing into that fund would be a four hundred thousand dollars that are primarily intended for the design work that we're starting to get underway. There has been a memo by Brooke. Would you like to elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Um, as Jeff mentioned, this agenda item does include a capital project ordinance that will create this multi-year capital project fund, and it, that will accumulate all the costs associated with the Given Memorial Library and Tufts Archives expansion project that will occur or is planned to occur uh, in a few years. The ordinance initially funds the architect, architectural and design costs with the transfer of 400000 as he mentioned. And those funds are appropriated in the fiscal year 2022 general fund budget um, as a transfer. So after the design and construction, or after the um, expansion is designed and construction costs are estimated, then the capital project fund budget will be amended to include those construction costs once we know more uh, about what that figure will be. The appropriation for that transfer will lapse on June 30th, and that's why we're requesting to open this fund. That way, uh, the fund will be created and we'll have a place uh, for the design proposals as those come in uh, over the next little bit. Uh, we'll have the fund prepared for that. So one question. What, what's the status of the uh, contract? It's out there. Is it out there for bid now? or the July 15th. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Are there other questions of uh, Brooke on the capital fund? Is there a motion then? Um, I'll move to approve Ordinance 2206, adopting the Library Expansion Capital Project Fund for the design and construction of an expansion of the Given Memorial Library and Tufts Archives building for the Village of Pinehurst. The motion is by Jane uh, Hogeman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Pazella. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you very much, Brooke. Mr. Sanborn, item number 12. All right, item number 12. Uh, this is Darren. <laughs> uh, and this is uh, your opportunity to consider uh, the Village Place Rattlesnake, Rattlesnake Trail small area plan. For those uh, in the Village Hall here, as well as listening in, this presentation will be made by um, Darren Burke, our Director of Planning, and Alex Cameron, our Senior Planner. The uh, Council has been supplied with staff memorandum and a number of other documents, uh, as we have in the past, returning to this discussion of the small area plan. Tonight we'll be talking just about the Village Place small area plan, I believe. That's correct. And uh, Darren, I think it was your idea to go through the staff memo a little bit and uh, take it to... Uh... 
Well, there was just a, there was one error in the staff memo that we discussed. Um, it was on page four, and that and we're going to get into the yeah. the meat of the right. of the presentation. In the right. Minute, but there was an error uh, where we said, and this will come into play later on with with the three lots on Magnolia Road. I think I had said in, in the staff report I had said east of Magnolia Road should really have said west of Magnolia. So that will become apparent when we start to look at the options, and, uh, and I've visualized all the options for you. Yeah. So I have, a, I have a PowerPoint, as you know that I want to do. There we go. And just to be sure, uh, I'll be watching uh, Jason in the back to make sure that we're picking up your microphone there so people right at home as well as here in Village Hall uh, can uh, hear that presentation. All right. So let's get started on the uh, review of the uh, small area plan. What we're asking for you tonight is to take a look at the Village Place small area plan. We're trying to get uh, some consensus on approval because what we want to start to move is to those next steps is doing the zone. There's, if the plans get approved as is or with modifications, they don't implement themselves. We have to do various actions to move, to move forward to kind of create if you look at the if you look at the cover page up there, you'll see you'll see the picture of the existing drone uh, shot of what it looks like now on the top, and below the rendering of what it could look like uh, if the plan is followed. If we can do something like that, so consideration uh, of the village place small area plan by council, uh, as you know, the P uh, Planning and Zoning Board reviewed it on five five twenty two, made a recommendation on the plan based on some of the options. Uh, that were presented based on some of the options that you are going to be looking at as part of as part of your of your review. Staff had developed four options for consideration for potential plan modifications, and that was based on previous planning and zoning discussions in the work session. Uh, P and Z could have also recommended additional modifications that were not staff developed at the time. All that's up. You can you can provide those modifications. Uh, council may amend the plans as is, or include the, plan, the planning and zoning recommendation, or maybe provide al alternative recommendations. I think this is a very important point, the next one. Approval of the plan in any form does not create the reality of any of the illustrations or renderings uh, shown will occur in the future. It's, it's a plan. We have to actively move forward to actually implement the plan. Just adopting it, it can sit on the shelf and do nothing, or it can sit on the shelf and do something, uh, but that requires uh, alternative or that requires additional actions. The plans provide a guide for the future for such actions as the zoning changes. That is one of the most important things to implement this plan is the zoning changes. To implement recommended land use and architectural detail and development of new streets, pedestrian paths. And those new streets and pedestrian paths, when you're talking about fund balance and capital improvements, those, you know, when you start to look at the way this plan lays out, there are certain roads that uh, the plan is calling for that we should potentially consider uh, constructing, things like that, path development. So uh, keep that in the back of your mind. All these things, they can't be done in a vacuum. Everything has to be, everything will have to find its way through a public process. If it's a zone change, it's planning and zoning board, it's council, public reviews, public hearings, those kind of things. Uh, if it's budgetary, again, it flows through uh, the village council. Uh, however, some aspect of the plan is objectionable, and I, I know we've heard uh, some issues with uh, there being some land use concerns, then, then it is warranted you should, you should be adjusting it. The Planning and Zoning Board made just such a recommendation uh, for some of those lots on Ma Magnolia. Most of the plan modifications that we've seen have centered around land uses on, on, uh, on the land west of Magnolia Road. So here, as you see it, this is the, uh, the circle are the two small area plans. Uh, the one, uh, the one on the top in the circle is Village Place, the one that we're working on right now. I don't know what that is, and something happened to my. Oh, hold on. Technical difficulties already. As per usual, I had a nice video for you just to kind of cap off and show what was going on. So let's try this. So here, now we're doing it. We're doing a drone run from the north to the south. So you can start to see what the area looks like. Let's stop a few times. So here you can see this is, this is, the, this is the part of the project boundary area. These are those, this is those, that subdivision developed on the west side of, or east side of Rattlesnake. 
Uh, here you're starting to look and you, you see a lot of uh, area on the, on the west side of um, Rattlesnake that, you know, we, we did show some plans for how these areas could be developed. You see the, you see the apartments, the two apartment buildings on, on a rather large assemblage of, of property. They're, at, they're currently actually uh, non-conforming uses over there, I believe, because they're zoned R10. We start, here we are, we're running south, and we're starting to get towards the village core area. And here's another perspective. So you, so you start to see this, uh, this is Kelly Road, and then you can start to see the, really the older part, of, I mean, it's all older part of the district, but you start to come into this area between McCaskill and Kelly, between McIntyre and between Rattlesnake, and you have a lot of older uses in this area that this, you know, I, I, you know there's other areas of the village, the village place planning area that will get developed first, of course. We have lands that, this is Village of Pioneer's lands, it's about an acre over here. There is an approved, uh, there's an approved concept plan, general concept plan for a, for a mixed use building on this side of two, of, two, uh, of two stories. They have been patiently waiting through this process to see what kind of the architectural and character details that will come out of, uh, that will come out of the plan or come out of the, the, the updates. As we move south, you'll start to see this area is gonna probably take a while to go under some type of form of redevelopment just because there are a number of smaller properties uh, that would have to be acquired. Keep going. Nope, one other important concept. We've got Clark, we got Clark Chevrolet over here. And so that's also within the planning area. You don't see, I don't see much changing right now into this area, but right over here, when you start to get along McIntyre, this is a vacant developable land that is currently zoned uh, NC. Uh, and then if they ever want to do some improvements on this corner to these buildings or anything in here, uh, any, any, of the, any of the form based code or any of the zoning code impl implementation things with respect to uh, architectural detail would apply. Nope. Keep going to the south. Now you're going to get into the really into the core area, which is really gonna be the active area uh, where we're trying to get a little bit more retail usage and restaurants, things like that. So here you see the public services facility. This is the public, for, generally the public services facility in this area. That's, you know, in order to implement this plan, uh, we'd have to relocate the public services facility. We also really need to deal with the Morconi water tank site to create one larger piece uh, of uh, potential land that we could actually act as a master developer or, or work with, I should say, work with a master developer to potentially develop that area to how we, how we would like it to see. You also have, in this area, you've got the uh, Moore County EMS. Uh, that would be something else that, that could, that's probably not for the vision that we have for that area, probably is not the, uh, uh, the appropriate land use in that area. The one impediment that you're gonna probably have right now for the long term would be the Hughes Plumbing Supply building right here at the termination of Rattlesnake. Of, of Rattlesnake. Uh, this is a long-term lease, uh, and I think this one is gonna be in here for a long time, so we'll have to be planning, unless something changes, we'll have to be planning around that one uh, for into the foreseeable future. Now you start to see, uh, now you start to get some more into, into the village core area. You see this, this assemblage of land, this is a few acres of land just, uh, just north of the brewery uh, that's usually, that's typically, I think it's still on the market right now. So you, can, you have some redevelopment potential over here. You also have the tradition site where there's, a, where there's a development plan that has been approved previously on the tradition site. And then you have the three lots that we'll be talking about later on Magnolia. And as you can see, it terminates kind of at the vista along the manor right over here. So you can see, you can see what you know this area really looks like. It, it's it is an industrial area. This really has the look of, and and feel in this area of of an industrial feel. The goal of the plan is to transition this out into a more active, you know, kind of a, a an offshoot or an offshoot of the village core area to offer some of the to have that, some of that same character. So I'm going to. I'm gonna get out of this now and go back to the presentation. I'll go back. I had the drone running the other way in, in what was supposed to be in the in the photo. In the
in a PowerPoint presentation. All right, so just more pictures that we're seeing. So you're seeing that one perspective shot. Look at, on the left, look into the north, and on the right, you're seeing uh, the southward view that you just looked at. Uh, here, you're seeing a good perspective of um, the land. Uh, you're seeing the, the, the one-acre site, and it's better for me to be over here because I can have the, I can have the. So over here, you're looking at this is this is the site that the, is the village's site. It's that one-acre site. Here, if you see, you'll see in a couple slides, here's Kelly Road that comes through, and there's a plan that could either bring Kelly Road through as a road through, to, through the Magnolia or a pedestrian path. So you see something like that. And you can look up towards, you know, you see good shots of the Arbor, Arboretum on, on both of these photos. Here on the left, on this side, you're just looking, you're looking down, you're seeing some of McIntyre, you're seeing some of Rattlesnake. Uh, and we have some recommendations in that area as well. Here's that, here's that site, that Punch Jones site that's currently, I think, believe currently on the market. That there's going to be some development restrictions on this one, just because it looks like there's some wetness down there. Uh, so this might be a little bit more challenging to develop. You can see in the back here in the background, you can see the tradition site that's been you know, prepped for development. So when we, when we get into the plan itself, so here's the, here's the cover page, and, and here's kind of the meat. This is the table of contents. This is how the plan lays out. And I circle the recommendations section because, yeah, we have the introduction. We have the existing conditions. What, you know, what's, the, what's the land use? What's the zoning? What, that stuff. Where was the public outreach? And then we get into the recommendations. The recommendations are really the meat of where, this, of where the plan goes. It, it tells you when you start to look at the illustrations, of what the building types, what the land use potentially is, where there, where where road should go, uh, where path should go. So that you know that is really where you know when we when we take the next steps with this plan, that's what we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at these. We'll be looking to try and figure out well what type of zoning updates do we need to make. What does a regulating plan look like for that? So when the plot when the process started out. Uh, when we started out this, and you're going to see uh, uh, some pictures that were illustrations that were done uh, back to when we started. This is called a party block diagram. And this is a, just a visual concept of how, when we looked at it, when the planners looked at it, and you, and you saw how it could lay out. So you could see how the roads can act, could actually lay out based on, uh, based on topography, based on existing uses. So you can see, this was the original, this was kind of the original concept that this was discussed. This was discussed early on in the process. Now what you'll see on the proposed plans is a lot of these roads have come off, have come off these illustrations. But it's a very important point that, you know, we did look at it and we consider it. Previous council, pre we made choices to pull those out. So here you can see in this picture, a lot of those roads are gone, but this is a pr proposed open space and pedestrian plan. So what you can see is you, you still continue to see the uh, roads going through, kind of that creating that crossroads in the, uh, in the village core area. It's just so much easier from over here. So you still see that, that crossroads. So this is where when I was talking about making future potential public, public investments is do we, do we consider you know, installing a road in here, constructing a road uh, once, we do, once we have the, the public services facility dealt with and or we, we can get a hold of the potentially work with and get in the county, county sites. What are, the other things we're showing is we're, we're showing potential of the development of a uh, central green kind of area in, in this area that would be used for various functions. Uh, you can see it's well connected. If you all the all these little little uh, dot, these dotted lines, orange lines, show connections to the, to various parts of the neighborhoods that surround it. So if you look, if you go up Rattlesnake, Rattlesnake really doesn't have a sidewalk. It goes down to woods, but below woods, uh, between woods and McCaskill, there's no sidewalks. We see a lot of people walking on the street. Rattlesnake is a collector. It's a main collector into this area, so it gets it, it collects a lot of traffic. So we, you know, if you look at the design plan, you'll see a call for putting some sidewalks in there. Uh, and they would be, in some areas, in the commercial areas, especially would be paver type. Another important consideration would be this one for Kelly. So you see Kelly wrote, see Kelly's here, but it could actually come through here to Magnolia. You could put a pedestrian path in here and look at what it would do, because you see this blue trail. This is, this is the trail system, the Village Greenway Trails. You could hook into a, and create a, a real broad network 
of pedestrian and greenway trail system uh, following uh, some of the re recommendations of this plan. You also see, that I know, and I remember we all had a lot of talk on this amphitheater that's, that's shown in here. It's not a requirement that goes in here, but it was part of the planning process, and that was kept in. It doesn't have to happen. It requires the village to do something to make that happen. Uh, so here were some of the concepts of, of that amphitheater. And on the right, you're, you're seeing the types of uh, uh, green spaces and public spaces that the plan envisions. envisions, envisions. Uh, here is the proposed uh, circulation plan. So you can see when we're talking about how we, how we really scale back the amount of roads, we're not showing a, a heck of a lot of roads. You're showing road connections through you know, that area to create the crossroads around Pinehurst Brewery and also connecting up to McIntyre. And I will note that if you look at the thoroughfare plan and you look at the, the, the new core plan, that connection actually used to connect through Rattlesnake, through Two, or two Orange, and I think, they, I think the connection shown was by the, uh, the old fire station site. As part of this process, when we kicked it off, we said, no, we don't want that, rat we don't want Rattlesnake to be the main connection in. We want to connect through McIntyre, and the plan has been changed to reflect that. We also changed, uh, we also changed, uh, this is uh, Power Plant Road. That was not originally going to be the, the through street. It was going to be through here by the fire station. As part of those discussions uh, with council, we moved, to, we moved to this idea. Darren? Yes. Just one question as we go along. Mm -hmm. the, the dotted lines in here, mm -hmm. those are meant to be pathways, but not necessarily roadways, correct? These are meant to be proposed streets. Now, if you go back to two, two slides, yep. the, the orange ones, those are meant to be some type of pedestrian network. Right, okay. It could be greenway trails, it could be sidewalks, it could right. be sand clay paths, anything like that. Right. And, and if you see it on both sides of a, you see them on two sides, generally that's a road coming through. Okay, thanks. So yeah, here, uh, here this is meant to be a, a potential road construction. There's no timing on when these could be because they have to be built by somebody. I would say that from a, from a planning, from a implementation standpoint, if we want to see anything occur uh, that we want to control on a development, it would be in this area south of McCasco around the brewery to create this, to, to create this crossroads. Uh, Rattlesnake Trail, uh, again, as you walk down Rattlesnake Trail, one on the left side of the photo of the illustration shows the existing conditions, and there are no sidewalks really down it. And then you look at the proposed section where we are showing sidewalks on either side. Uh, then you start doing some plantings where you can put some plantings and landscaping and trees and things like that along Rattlesnake. Uh, the plan also calls for uh, several types of, uh, two, two, two types of streets to be established a commercial street section and a residential street section. It's in the plan that there's various uh, um, dimensions that you can see in the plan for how, how we envision that laying out. In order to do something like this, and this is another thing where we might have to do uh, a change to, the, to our engineering uh, specifications and standards manual to make this happen because it relates, a lot of street construction relates to the, the ESSM. Uh, so again, as part of the history of the process, we had looked at early on uh, a kind of a low intensity option and a high intensity option that you can see here. And really the, the major differences in between these two options were down here at the crossroads around the brewery. You can see there's, in this, in this section, there, there's less, it's probably, you know, these could be live work units, mixed use units. And then you go over on the right in the higher intensity option. And what you're seeing is this, is this could be the potential location for a hotel or a larger mixed use, uh, things like that. So that, that's the major difference between the two. When we went to council, I think it was last July, and we started to talk about some of these issues that we're going to get into, uh, we actually flipped out or, or changed some of the land uses along uh, North Rattlesnake here that, we, that the, the consultant originally showed as residential in that area. Uh, there was some concern that we can't control the quality of residential in, we just can't control the quality of residential through zoning. Uh, so we, we flipped that, we, we adjusted the potential land use scenario in that area. To, and we thought that, you know, potentially medical offices or professional offices might work better up here closer to uh, Highway 211. This ended up being, this was the preferred plan that after we had that, after we had that discussion with council back in July, 
that we ended up, this is where this scenario ended up. So you can see where previously we had shown single family and attached uh, units that we went over up in this area to show, you know, th this, this type of illustration or, or figure is to, denotes either a mixed use building or an office type building. And then you're going down here, the major change, which again we're gonna talk to, is this area along, uh, is this area along uh, um, Magnolia Road where we're now showing, instead of that single family pattern, we're showing the pattern for non-residential. And I can tell you the, some of the reasons why we had looked at why non-residential, why we had supported non-residential in that particular area, was given, if you look at the what, if you look at the east side of Magnolia, it's, it's either commercial, it's either non-residential or it's industrial, or it's industrial looking, you have, a, you have a hospitality up here in the manor. But we were, we, when, from a planning principle, we try and align both sides of the block so they're, so they're similar type land uses to not run into some of the problems that we have in other parts of the community. I mean, you hear the frequent complaints that we have along Ritter Road with the, uh, with the presence of the hotel in that area and, and some of the complaints now about the compatibility of those two land uses. You hear less of those complaints when you have two of the same land uses that are, that are adjacent to one another. So here, just a little bit more detail and again, this detailed plan just shows a little bit more of how that area could lay out and how that area could look. And again, focusing on this, this area on the west side of Magnolia Road. I mean, I think uh, from a, I think that this particular rendering has got a lot of positive reaction to it, at least in the people that I've talked to. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of issues that I've seen in this particular area. I've seen a lot, we've had a lot more discussion out here on the uh, west side of Magnolia. So here would be, uh, here's the uh, perspective view. This is looking at, so we're right here, we're sitting at these crossroads. So this is, the cro this is the crossroads we're talking about, and we're looking this way to the west. So you can see that's kind of the vision of how this could be, how this could come together. And what you're seeing is you're seeing potential restaurants, you're being, seeing poten potential storefronts. And the way to do that is you, you create an act, a requirement for an active building frontage on these streets. So you can see there's lots of fenestration, it's windows and doors. So you see a lot of that to kind of, we're trying to emulate some of those things in the village, co in, in village center. You see a lot of this type of uh, activity in the village center. There's, they have highly fenestrated looks. Uh, again, here's the, here's the perspective shot. So, Staff recommends approval of the, of the village uh, place SAP with the following considerations. And we're gonna, we're gonna visualize these all next. So, one, support the non-residential land use pattern along Magnolia Road as shown in the detail plan, page 56, and the preferred building, build out, building or build out plan on page 71. And that what this really refers to, it refers to this area. And this was the area that was under consideration by the Planning and Zoning Board, and we're getting to that recommendation in a moment. Two, support residential single-family attached or detached along Magnolia Road, uh, uh, retaining the single-family de detached pattern up until Cadell. So this, would be, this could be a potential attached single-family pattern. So it's like a townhouse. This could potentially be a townhouse. Or you, do, you could allow a re, you know, the, the single, this single-family pattern along Magnolia. And what in both, in both instances, we're looking to transition to single family against Cadell, because once again, we're trying, to, we're trying to align the land uses on both sides of, of the street. So that's a, that's a, that's consistent, uh, that's a consistent recommendation. Option three, support residential single family detached along the Magnolia Again, this is one of the original recommendations in the plans was they were showing the, the single family recommend, the single family along, uh, along Magnolia. Uh, so that could, be, that could be another option uh, to follow. And then four, option four, this is the, the flexible option that, uh, that the Planning and Zoning Board worked on a bit and uh, came up with a recommendation. And basically what it does is it says, allow residential or non-residential along Magnolia within the original focus area boundaries and maintain the, the single family detached transition to Cadell Road. So how that looks on this particular drawing is, 
what that would do is that would change this landform, or really what doesn't really change the landform because the zoning right here is R10. So really what it does is it maintains the status quo in this area that's outside of the original boundaries, and it allows there to be some flexibility in land use along uh, the Magnolia Road frontage, non-residential or residential, while transitioning back as you get to Cadell into single family, again, to mirror up both sides of the road. So that option would potentially allow, if, you, if they went all single family, it would allow, a, a, you know, you'd see something similar, I mean, a, a pattern similar to this. Uh, this, uh, this could be, a, still could be a mixed use building if you allow that uh, flexibility. So here uh, on the left is the preferred concept plan, again, showing all the commercial. And then the public, work, the, the public workshop number two concept showing the, uh, the single family layout perspective. And then here we're back to the, we're back to the uh, recommendations of option one, two, three, and four. And then what I wanted to get into you a little bit with is, because there's, sometimes there's some confusion about what the plan represents and how we do calculations. Because, you know, we, we, we did some trip calcs, we did some, uh, some financial analysis, and, the, and it's really, it's a generalized analysis because we can't do a specific analysis because we're not at the we're not at the very we're not at the detail level that we can do that. So, what happens is you start. Let's start with the comprehensive plan. This is the comprehensive plan recommendation on the left. There's no you can't really there's no detail here. We don't know how this is going to look. That's why we went into the process of going to the small area plan, and we started to look. We started if you look on the right, it starts to show how this area on the left could actually look on the right. Then we take it a little bit further, so, so all, all the boxes represent some type of building form. So we can run some stats off, of, off those building forms. So then you go back in, on the left, you're seeing, you're seeing that overall plan, but on the right now, we get more detail. So that from that detail, you can see where, where the potential parking lots could be, where the roads are, things like that. So this just shows more detail, but it's still, it's hard to run any precise calculations because we don't know what the development's going to be there in, in actuality. Here, here on the left, you're seeing the original, uh, this was, is this was excerpted from the 2007 new core plan. So you look, at the, you look at the detail of the new core plan on the left, and you look at what we were able to achieve with this, with this effort. I, I, I know how the, the, this recommendation really gives me a better perspective than how this, this, the new core plan was. So it actually added uh, some detail to the new core uh, plan itself. And here we get into, here's, here's uh, the Piner South, which we'll be talking about hopefully soon. So you can see this, this whole area is shown as mixed use uh, center stack residential. This doesn't really give you an idea of how this area is going to develop other, other than you want mixed use stacked residential. But, you know, we've already had one development move forward. Uh, against the comprehensive plan, in, in, uh, inconsistent with the comprehensive plan recommendation, this is the Pioneer South Cottages. They had to move forward because they're, they're zoned appropriately. But what I'm trying to get at is when you see the detail on this plan, this is where we can start running numbers. We can start running trip generations. We can start running actual trip generation. We can know what, what, the, uh, what the estimated uh, financial cost will be in here because we're at that detail. Same thing with the Pioneer's Brewery. When you start to look at the Pioneer's Brewery, you can see we can start measuring out uh, floor areas. We can and look at how much parking is needed, how much will that, how much will you know, become valued at, where are some of those financial impacts. Same thing with the with the parking deck. So these are the real detail plans that drive fiscal analysis, that drive trip generations, because these are actual knowns. We're doing everything. What we're doing is a generalization. Pine yourself again. So, I. So I am ready to turn it back over to you all, and I'm done for now. Okay, you're going to come back to the front desk here? I, no, I'm going to stay over here. I'm, I'm uh, one comment and then a question uh, for me. Um, I remember back to the um, initial layout and uh, zoning request for what is now the, what was and still is the traditions of Old Town site. I remember when that was done, I remember when the place was a jungle and all the 
trees and whatnot being taken down, nothing that was uh, very valuable in there other than the longleaf pines along the streets at border, which are very nice. Um, and the idea was, and, and, and in my mind, I favor this idea, is that that, that site continues to be uh, or, or becomes a, a transition site uh, from residential, which is it was then and still pretty much is now, you know, all around what is that, what is that site. Now, that could be um, th uh, detached or attached in the site, but it's a transition site um, from the residential areas that uh, are to the west, to the south mm -hmm. uh, of that, and, um, and leading up to um, the Manor Hotel. Mm -hmm. um, and so for that reason, on the one hand, I, I think um, retaining the three lots as residential lots uh, as is called for in one of the options here is, is, is the appropriate thing uh, to do. Now, um, in my mind, though, I'm a little up in the air on, on options two and four. The real difference between options two and four, Darren, at least on the um, residential nature of it, is that in option two, we would have attached or detached single-family residences along Magnolia Road frontage, retaining right. that. And then in the uh, option four, that could happen, or non-residential could happen uh, as well. And option four has the um, request to keep the, uh, the three lots in the residential zoning. Is that the main difference? That, that's correct. And really what you're looking at, one of them says single family only, one of them says single family or attached, one of them says that one, all non-residential, and the other, option four, which is a flexible option, mm -hmm. backs out those three lots, retains them as single family, retains their, their existing zoning. We don't mess with the zoning on those properties as we move forward. And to the north, when we start to look at the, developing the form-based code and, and regulating plan, we would put the option to have various building types within there. So it could be single family attached, it could be, it could be uh, mixed use, resident, you know, things like that. So it'd be non-residential and single pattern only really in the area that's up here on the frontage and to some point back because as we as we transition back to Cadell, we want to make sure that that area right. is maintained in single family detached usage right. again to align the other side of the block. Right, right. So the idea anyway from my point of view is a transition site, residential transition, um, which was what was intended in the first place but that never came to pass for a whole variety of reasons and I'm glad we had the opportunity to put this into the plan here uh, now. So those are a couple of thoughts for me. I'm sure other council members have a bunch of questions on this, um, but I've been trying to focus on the Magnolia Road issue since that was one of the things that yep. the planning board was debating quite a right. bit, and, uh, and we have as, as well. So I'll leave it with my, those being my questions for the moment and uh, turn it to my left and my right. Um, maybe Jeff Morgan, do you have any questions you'd like to ask of um, Darren at this point? Uh, no specific questions. I, I really appreciated the detail, specifically the uh, uh, transportation routes that you described, uh, uh, bicycle, golf cart, pedestrians, and I think that's critical for the plan itself as we're moving forward. So, so uh, Jeff, that. could you speak up just a little bit? I'm sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, but uh, I appreciated the transportation plan that you had there. Okay, that was going into that. So I think it's a lot of good work that's gone into this. Um, Planning and Zoning Committee uh, recommended option four. Can you give me specific reasons why they recommended that? Well, I think there was, I, I think it went down to, you know, we kind of moved off the, the original boundaries of, of the focus area four. And when we moved off those boundaries, it was because when we moved from a, when we moved from a, um, So when we moved from what was previously, in previous renderings of uh, the public workshop two, you saw a bunch of single family on, on the west side of Magnolia. As a staff, we sat down and looked at, and we looked at the area and what we were trying to achieve in that area, especially along Magnolia. And given what was on the east side of Magnolia as being a non, that's where we wanted to promote non-residential, to line up the land use on the west side, we went to the, to, um, the recommendation for um, for commercial. And then when we saw that those three lots were, were vacant, we said, it, it, you know, why would, why would we just stop at the, at the boundaries? Why not look at moving that commercial, that commercial pattern a bit to the north uh, to, you know, because it, it really it was across from that telco, uh, Century, it was at CenturyLink. So we, those, the commercial buildings would, 
would be facing the, the, the telco site, and I think that was that was what that was what in our decision making process to recommend that. And I can't. That was a staff recommendation, but the recommendation from the planning board was option yeah. four. That, that was on four, but I'm, I'm giving you the genesis of where we were last June yeah. after public workshop two and, and how and how this happened. But so if you can see on the board, so this the, these two commercial buildings, one of the re, these are those three lots. So one of the reasons why we were looking at that is we were looking at what is the land use that's directly across the street from that land use. Yeah. It's a non-residential, it's an industrial land use. We thought this would be a better land use. We would have never said anything. Say, say if these this pattern was already developed with, 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 with single family residential, we wouldn't, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have made any recommendation on that. But as planners, when we see vacant land and we see potential to change the land use, we're, we're, we, we make those recommendations. We had that discussion with council. Right. But Took the, it all the way through the process and the planning and zoning board met on May 5th and said, you know what, uh, we still think that the better, the, the better plan is not to include those three lots to back them off, retain those as single family residential, and allow that flexibility in this particular area. Je Jeff, just yeah. to, uh, I think I can Alex. expand a little bit on uh, the discussion. Jeff's question, that, yes. Mm -hmm. So it, again, the, the planning and zoning board as a whole felt it was worthwhile to preserve the original boundary, so exclude those three lots on the west side directly across, and um, preserve single family detached residential along the Cadell Road side, but liked, uh, and, and I'm sorry, in, in the north side of McCaskill, but on the Magnolia, Magnolia Road frontage area there, they liked the opportunity to have flexibility with either single family detached or attached, as well as uh, a, a mixed use type land development. So again, to preserve the original boundary, preserve single family detached along Cadell Road and the north end fronting McCaskill, but the remaining area that traditions of Old Town site fronting uh, on the west side of uh, Magnolia Road, having a flexible uh, approach, you know, whether it be a mixed use, whether it be a single family attached or detached. So it would have some sort of varying, but then you would still have that transition, Mayor Strickland, that you mentioned, coming back south down Magnolia to where the other existing single family residential lots are. Thank you, Selva. No further questions. Uh, and just to clarify my point, um, the transition idea that I'm referring to is a transition in residential housing type, not necessarily a transition from residential to, to commercial or mixed use. That's what I recall the plan was for that site, and I've always kind of favored that. So that's where the attached and detached um, uh, opportunities come within that, uh, within that zone as well. Just my thought. Uh, I Jeff, think everybody's uh, please. wrestling with it the right important question here, and it is the transition. The transition between uses like that is hard. It, there's not, we're not gonna find a perfect solution here. <laughs> the question is what is, strikes the most appropriate balance. And I think that, I think that to, when the staff looked at this situation, particularly with, the, with regard to what's currently called the traditions right. lot, that land. Mm -hmm. And you think about the possibility of having single family residential directly across the street from the brewery and all that traffic and hubbub and parking and people and activity and then whatever else gets developed across the street there in that undeveloped property that's also commercial, that that was problematic. And so there, there you know, is there a, is there an opportunity to, to make a more gradual transition as you go across the street to something that's maybe mixed use or multifamily or something like that to, that eventually gets to the the single family that's on the the back side of that. Jeff Morgan, did you have any other points on that? All right. Jane, would you like? Thank you. Um, looking specifically at mag this section of Magnolia. Um, my concern has been and remains um, that if you look at the existing zoning in this area um, on the west side of Magnolia, it's R10 except for the tra traditions area itself, which is village residential. 
Village residential permits a great deal of flexibility within residential, different types of residential buildings. So it can be single family attached, single family detached condos, townhomes, etc. But it's all residential. And then on the east side of Magnolia, right now we have, um, what was that, uh, village mixed use? Yeah. And, and that's what it will stay, essentially. But Magnolia itself is the boundary line. And if we move the boundary line and between residential and commercial, and allow commercial encroachment on the west side of Magnolia, I believe that we will be doing a great disservice to the existing residential neighborhoods in the R10 zone on the west side of Magnolia. And that's not, that's not fair to them. Um, I have seen in other towns um, what happens when you have commercial along a, a, a busy business street, and immediately behind the commercial, you have residential. Those, those fringe residential neighborhoods are adversely impacted by traffic and all that kind of stuff, and headlights and parking and busy hours at night and so forth. So having the street remain the boundary seems to me as a practical matter to be the best thing. And I would not want to see encroachment of commercial across to the west side of Magnolia. I do think that ha retaining the residential flexibility for the tra tradition site is a great idea. And to the north, on the north side of um, McCaskill, there's the Green's apartment building, so that's you know, residential multifamily, and then you have the tradition site, which could have many, be developed as many different possible options for residential, and then you get down into the R10. And I think that's, that's great. We have plenty of places in the village where there's commercial on one side of the street and residential on, on the other. In fact, on, as you go farther south on Magnolia, there's the Manor Inn and there's residential immediately across the street from it. And that seems to have survived for, for a while. So I, I, I'm just saying, my, um, my preference for this strip is to um, pretty much keep the current zoning status quo. I would allow the residential flexibility for um, the tradition site which it already has, and I would return the um, the uh, outline of the small area plan to what it was shown in the comprehensive plan, and leave uh, those three lots as R10. I think that that makes the most sense to me, from a practical point of view, for fitting into the neighborhoods that are around it, because it, we've got to fit it into Cadell and, and the other residential uh, neighborhoods as well. Is it OK to make a couple comments about can, other places on the small area plans sure. as well? Sure. Should Jane, I, just move over to Jane, can I, just I, I don't have much, but. Jane, can I just respond real quick to that? And yeah. I'll just say the, the concern from the staff perspective, I can tell you why we made some of that recommendation, is if we do go all all single family attached, single family attached. Our concern would be, as Jeff kind of laid out, that what's on the east side of Magnolia is going to be that commercial area that where you're going to have brewery, you're going to have you know lots of other uses. So I think the concern from our standpoint is how much, you know, what what type of what we're going to do for the quality of life for those folks on the other side, and what type of you know type of complaints were we going to be dealing with? So things like that. So I can tell you that that was kind of it. That was in, I, I don't disagree with your thought process. I'm just telling you where our thought process is. Can, on can I add to that as well? I mean, I, I think that um, the problem's much more acute for those three lots, those three residential lots, 
because there's no depth there. Um, and so you're either going to have the abrupt tra transition at the street or at the back of those lots. And I, th I, can, I, I can appreciate why that's a difficult decision. But on the tra traditions lot, you have depth to take advantage of with a development plan that makes a more gradual transition in an appropriate way. And so, for example, you could have mixed use along the, along the, um, the street frontage on Magnolia and then transition slowly back to the single family that's on the back side. So you're or there could be extensive buffering there that aids that transition. Or I mean, there are different options to depth creates possibilities. You don't have the, the benefit of that with, the, with the, the three lots that are directly across the street from Century. So Point. you're advocating, or advocating, but you're describing what's in option four, which was what the Planning and Zoning Board recommended to give the added flexibility along Magnolia at, in the, within the transitions, it's not transition, traditions parcel to have some kind of non-residential just along the street. Yeah, I, I, to, 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 and to say that again, I think that depth is a good thing because it creates opportunities to make a more effective that's, transition. That's true. And maybe a, a visual to help with that, because um, this is something obviously, as Jeff mentioned, staff took into account, as well as the Planning and Zoning Board. Uh, maybe a little hard to see, but uh, on the, the, the diagram on the right, if you can find my cursor, I'm here at the intersection of Magnolia and McCaskill. So the reason in uh, potentially allowing for the flexibility in, in that land use for a single family attached or a mixed use along just this section of Magnolia is if you can see here, you have the, these, these building structures. So the, the existing single family neighborhoods that you wanna be sympathetic to that we, we as well, you can see how, how they align here. So the option four would keep that single family detached landform adjacent to all those residents. So cradling up against those existing single family residents. And as Jeff said, the the lots that would be probably most impactful as it starts to transition or across from those uses would be those the three lots in question of that boundary. Right. So these areas here, um, in order to maybe better transition or to or to screen if that you know the single family detached here, um, you know for parking lot landscaping requirements or parking requirements in general. And. You know, to be fair, those three lots, I, mean, I, don't, I don't find them very appealing myself. So maybe somebody might want to build a house there eventually, um, but they'll have to make that choice, and uh, they'll choose to live there. And the good news is, while the, the CenturyLink building currently isn't all that necessarily attractive, there's not a lot of commotion there. No, no. But what could happen, what currently is happening at the brewery, and what could happen with the development that occurs farther north on that block could be much more impactful which is why I, I don't like to see the encroachment of commercial to the west side of Magnolia. I'd rather keep it to the east side, and there's interior parking areas provided there where the parking would be, as opposed to if you look at the right-hand uh, rendering, um, and you see uh, indications of commercial buildings coming down the west side of um, Magnolia, and behind them, the parking, which backs right up to single family residential on Cadell. So I see that as a, as a problem. I, I'd rather keep the commercial all on the east. Um, that just, you, you can't take advantage of the depth then, and you're, you're left with that abrupt change across the street. Well, but there can be, a variety of different kinds of residential, which there, is what it's zoned for now. Yeah. There is some significant grade change in that area too. Uh, I don't know if that helps or not, but if if parking would be in the rear there, it would be situated much further down grade than any of the single family attached. So there wouldn't be opportunity as as much direct headlight. You'd overlook the whole thing. <laughs> As, as you would overlook it from the other side of Magnolia Road. Well, 
it, it's you overlook it's it one way or the other. Not, not wonderful to have. Ben, you had some other questions, though, did you on the plan? Sorry? You had some other questions you wanted to I address. I had a couple other questions. Why don't you do yeah. those and then we'll move along here. Very, very quickly. Um, at the very top of Magnolia, uh, where it, from Woods Road, it, it uh, crosses, Woods Road crosses Rattlesnake, and I guess at that point it turns into Magnolia, and it turns the corner by the Rehabilitation Center. And, and right at the, at the corner there, um, there's a couple of, of buildings shown, and I believe those were indicated to be commercial, even though they're on village property, which is now zoned mm -hmm. um, PC. PC, correct. Right. Um, public conservation. Is yes. I, I don't have a problem indicating that we might put some future civic buildings there, but not commercial buildings. So that, that was one point. Another is um, this plan now shows commercial all the way down um, the west side of Rattlesnake from, from Woods down to McCaskill. And over you know, a year ago, we had a couple of meetings and we talked about should that be residential or commercial or part of it residential and part of it. You know, and and I, I understand the um, reason for selecting commercial was to be able to ensure the quality of development and so forth. Um, but I would like to um, say that because there is so much residential traffic and circulation, kids on bikes and moms with strollers and the parks and the community center and the elementary school and so forth, that we keep that um, commercial local, serving local needs as opposed to regional draw type commercial. So a regional medical center that's a, a specialty that would be pulling people in from other towns and so forth I don't think we would want to do. I think we want to keep the traffic circulation local and low key. So I'd just like to make that point. Have we, have we taken any kind of a good look at the sufficiency of parking that we're providing? Probably not yet, but I, I do think that that's going to be important to do. There's um, a reference somewhere in here. I didn't write down my page number like a dope, but... Um, it says, take a look at um, having, you know, less parking. Well, no. <laughs> we have to have enough parking, and we have to have enough parking. We, apparently, the manor and um, the brewery are, are shy some spaces now, and so we're going to have to have enough to accommodate them as well as the new uses that go in, and we're planning to have, I guess, events and so forth in the new green space just south of McCaskill. Um, and we should make sure that there's adequate parking for, for those events as well. Um, that's it. And, you know, with respect to that one, um, with the parking, everybody's going to, they're going to have to require parking. They will have to meet our parking requirements. But until we know what that use is, it's the, if it's a restaurant, it's one to three seats. If it's a professional office, it's one to right. 300 square feet. So until we start coming together on that, we, we don't know what the actual, they'll have to require, they'll have to be, they'll have to require the parking, but the parking where they provide is we're gonna be, is where we're gonna get real interested in. Because we don't want that parking out in front of the building. We want that parking at least on the side, half of it, maybe some of it on the side, and most of it to the rear. So from, that can, that's where our most important consideration is gonna be. Yeah, you have to provide the parking that's required by the PDO, but where you put that parking, how it's landscaped, those are things that we're, we're going to really get into. Uh, your other question uh, up on the northern part of the Rattlesnake, I think, you know, it, it, I don't know how to do that using land, using a land, using the zoning code, but that might be something where you, you cap the size of buildings in that area so you're not, you know, so it's 10,000 square feet or it's 7,000 square feet. What you know? What are the? What are these regional uses? What are their typical sizes? And you cap and you cap those sizes. That may be a way of getting at that strategy that you're talking about. So that's something we have to discuss. Let me let me jump in on that one too. I, and this I know I know council's aware of this, but for the public it might be helpful to to say that 
there's a lot of detail in these pictures, but they're still just very aspirational. And what we'll endeavor to do when the council eventually adopts this plan, whether it's tonight or at a future meeting, is to develop zoning and develop code and form-based codes that we think are reasonably likely to achieve an outcome that's something like this. And then the next step will be, you know, as development opportunities come forward, we're going to have to evaluate those projects on whether or not they generally achieve the results that are shown here. And this goes back to your question about parking. At the end of the day, as, as Darren said, it will depend on the uses. And, and, you know, there may be a bigger parking lot here or a smaller parking lot there, um, or it might be a different location based on the uses. But we're looking for, we'll be looking for a result that isn't exactly this, but this is representative of what we're looking for. More comments? Okay. Uh, Patrick? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I have a, several things I want to comment on. First a lot of, of all, sticky notes there, I, Pat. Several things I want to comment on. Uh, I do not have the ability to project headlights into the future and where they may go. So I want to preference my statements with that. But the most, um, I think the most important thing in this plan is that it is aspirational. It is a 50-year horizon. So it gives us a lot of flexibility. I, 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 um, I am uh, very disappointed that the consultant that we uh, the village paid two hundred fifty thousand dollars for has not yet come before this council to present their work product. Matt, keep your voice up, please. That, that we, okay. Um, we had asked the council at, asked for that about five months ago. We've yet to see the consultant. The good news about the plan: it's very similar. I went through it page by page. You can see my little pink tags. Uh, it's very similar to the one that was provided in on January fourteenth to the council. So I have, I have a, a bunch of questions, uh, but let me, let me first touch on what Jane and sort of Jeff mentioned. Uh, I do believe, uh, I don't understand the whole three lot thing. As far as I can determine in the history of Pinehurst, those three lots were always residential except for some short period of time. And then they became possibly non-residential. And now I was at the planning and zoning board meeting when they took the action. It was a 5-1 vote to make them remain residential. So it wasn't, it wasn't really a, a close dis discussion or d decision amongst the Planning and Zoning Council. I agree with Councilwoman Hogeman. I am very reluctant to see development west of Magnolia, other than what we have zoned as the single family or detached homes, which is what was always envisioned. Uh, I, I get scared about the idea of a commercial building overlooking the Arboretum. One of the prides and joys of this community since I've moved here is that Arboretum. And the idea that a commercial building could be put right there looking at the entrance to it, I think this community would be repulsed by that. Because the reason, not, my, not, not that it can't be a very nice looking commercial building, is because a commercial building has no certainty as to the tenants that will be in there over a 50 year period. We don't know. But well, if we have a residential area, which it's now zoned for, we do know there'll be homeowners there. And so I, I very much agree with what the, Jane Hogeman said there. I do think the um, uh, east of Magnolia, uh, which is that area where we're really talking about, which is right for development, um, there are three things that have to happen for us to really become a player in that. We have to relocate the public services complex. We have to see that those, the Moore County property that has the water tanks and all, that we somehow acquire that through an exchange or a purchase. Uh, and we have to relocate the EMS a facility somewhere nearby because that will give us a, a, a significant amount of land that we can work with the developer and get serious about what's going to go there. Right now, these properties are owned by different components. 
We have no control over them. And I'm, my guess is there are developers who have some great ideas that what might go in there. And maybe we could work with them, but we, we can't. There's nothing we can do about it until we make those, we make those decisions as a council and have to get, acquire that property in a fashion that it gets right for development. So west of Magnolia, I think should be remain single family uh, or detached, however we do it, or a townhouse. But it, it, it should not be commercially developed. Uh, those, those lots, of course, should be uh, residential. Um, I, um, I'm very skeptical of the rattlesnake trail design. I, I, in the past, have mentioned the fact that that is not Rattlesnake Road or Rattlesnake Boulevard. It's Rattlesnake Trail. It's a narrow road of which a lot of kids ride bikes on, uh, people have golf carts on. Uh, this plan, so one of the reasons I want to talk to the consultant, actually anticipates parallel parking on Rattlesnake Trail. I don't know. They need to come down and visit a little more often. You can't have that parallel parking on Rattlesnake Trail unless you are going to expand all the way to Magnolia or the close to it. The, 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 the right of way, I believe, is wide enough to accommodate it. It's not designed currently to accommodate any of that. But you'll see people parking along the right of way, along, rattle, along Rattlesnake, especially I, you get south. I can just imagine being in line on Rattlesnake Trail waiting for the person in front of me to parallel park. But um, the, um, so we covered that. Um, there are some other things in here that the consultant did not pay close attention to. They make suggestions about the sites for a library. They need to catch up. We've got a site for a library. <laughs> we just moved $400,000 today to uh, design, to put out a contract uh, and pay for one to design the expansion right there uh, on the, off the Village Green. So um, to be uh, fair, Patrick, that's not their fault. We have to date, we have not, the council has not made a formal decision to do what you described. Well, I we know what's going to happen, but there's not been any formal decision to do that. I, well, the consultants should read some tea leaves sometimes of what we're doing, because I think that clouds some discussions. If, you're, if you read this, as I, as I did the other day, thoroughly, I'm thinking to myself, what, what did they miss there? But never mind. Um, the other thing that... Uh, disappoints me is, is a little bit of what I'll call uh, n not the appropriate recognition of a lot of public input. I, because I keep hearing from people different things about what they, from citizens. There are a lot of good things in here. I think the idea in the village place, if we get control of that property, is, uh, you know, they have some pretty clever layouts. But again, we have to be careful what goes in there. Because the boutique hotel of today becomes the Motel 6 of tomorrow when properties are flipped and commercial investors decide to go invest somewhere else. Once we designate property in a, in a zoning matter, it opens up into the future. It's just not that one-time development. If, we, if I could be assured we're going to have this beautiful boutique hotel there in perpetuity, I'd probably be all for it. But I just think we need to be careful. I'm not saying we, we should rule it out. It's obviously an option. But future councils are going to have to be careful because we are, and they mentioned this several times in here about the ambience and the character of the community. They used that phrase, I counted three times that they used it in here. So that showed me that they were attentive to that concern. But in the same breath, uh, some of what they're talking about uh, didn't seem as attentive. So um, just to recap, I, I, um, I wish they'd show up. I, I agree with what Councilwoman Hogeman said. I think the line needs to be drawn at Magnolia East and West as far as commercial development. Um, I, they, one of the things they question in here that I'm concerned about is our setback requirements. They made it a uh, uh, I think our setback requirements are pretty good. Uh, and I think we better be careful if we tamper with that. Because again, we're enroaching on the character and ambience of the community. Uh, on the traffic part, which is always sort of the 
$64,000 question. They do on page 63 uh, have some projections about trips. And, and actually in their report, they have the low density and the high density is how they break it out. I think they should know that the words high density in the village of Piner is right, out, right up there with snowstorm, okay? So we ought to stick with low density. But uh, they are um, projecting 7,700 daily trips is an increase then on page 63. Now, again, that could be one car going back and forth 7,700 7, times. It could be two cars going back and forth 3,500 times. I don't, I'm sure it's neither of those. I'm sure there's a formula they use. That's a lot of additional trips in the village of Pinehurst. And so we got to be careful there. Can I just answer that? that Please. That, that projection is run off those square footages in the development program. So a retail, a retail use generates this amount of traffic. An office generates this amount of traffic. A residential use develops this amount. So just. OK. Which, which reinforces the idea that we ought to be careful about how much commercial we put there. Because uh, I, I, now, re, uh, one thing I, I wanted to say is, is on the, uh, in respect to what Jane said. I don't have, uh, I think one of the key industries that we should keep attracting and is desirable is the healthcare industry. Uh, so an appropriate healthcare facility, if we can, uh, would be appropriate. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to rule that out. I don't think you were ruling it out. You're just being cautious. Um, but I think that fits in with our, uh, both the population here in the village, uh, the current uh, establishment, uh, first health and all, and so we should build on that, just like golf-related uh, items and, and uh, in the equestrian space, uh, we ought to build on what we have. Um, so the options, I like the option where we <laughs> don't develop commercially west of Magnolia, and we do develop east of Magnolia, we leave those lots where they should be, um, and we uh, we reinforce the idea that a lot of this aspirational, I guess, is the word we're stuck with. But that we don't want to, you know, scare the citizens that something is about. They've got we've got these diagrams out there and these artist conceptions, and I think when most people look at those, they don't think aspirational. They think something's happening real quick. Now, you know it, that's, nothing happens that quickly. I know it's not going to happen that quickly. But again, it takes me back to the issue about public input. I think when people went to some of those public meetings and saw those diagrams, they're thinking, this is, my gosh, this is going to happen really soon. Look at how thorough they are. They've got it right down to the trees. Uh, so um, we need to be careful there. Uh, I do appreciate the work. I, I've attended the planning and zoning board meetings because I'm interested in what they do. Uh, and I listened closely to their, uh, they had serious discussions uh, about these, this topic in general and, and as, as well as Village South. And we'll get to that at some other time. I don't know, Mr. Mayor, uh, if we actually need to vote on this tonight. Uh, maybe we can wait a couple of weeks and maybe have a look at another, some option we can all craft that it might be a better way to do this rather than do something, pull the trigger tonight because it's not, I don't see anything time sensitive to that of two weeks, unless you can demonstrate to me there's a big time sensitivity to that, I'll consider that. Anyway, those are my thoughts. I, I thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Councilman. Council Member Bosch, please. Thank you. Uh, I really don't have a whole lot to add to what you guys have added, but I want to echo something Jeff Morgan said. I really, Darren, Alex, I appreciate planning and zoning I appreciate all of the time you guys have put into this hard, hard work over, what, a year or so? Um, but something you had said before that I think is important, you've said to do nothing is not an option. And your drone picture showed that. To do nothing, it stays like that drone picture showed. So that's just, that is the wild, wild west when it comes to development. That's not a good thing. Um, another thing you've told us in the past that I think is really important, and Patrick, it goes to something you just said. You told us these plans have a self life, shelf life of seven to 10 years. So just this plan right now doesn't mean that 50 years from now, starting tomorrow, this is what Pinehurst is gonna look like. 
And the beauty of this is um, staff has to go through this, the public has to go through this every seven to 10 years, but that process reflects what the public wants as of that time. Mm -hmm. The public input, the marking analysis, everything else that went into this plan will go into the replacement for this plan. So, um, so anybody who thinks that we're gonna start doing this tomorrow, it's not. This is a step from what it looks like now to something better. Um, and I really, you know, I, I went through the planning, I went through your staff memo and looked at planning and zoning, and it was Jack Farrell's comment that really was persuasive to me. Um, the public has been told for two years that the boundaries are such, it's a mistake to tell the public one thing and do something else. And that led me to Magnolia the way you're proposing it, which is option four, which is, which is my preference. So, option four. So that, that's, I'm not saying anything, to, well, I guess I'm adding to the, the fact that this shelf list of seven to 10 year shelf life and to do nothing is not an option, but and to, thank you so much for your work. Now, Darren or Alex, do you have um, any uh, comments or feedback on questions or concerns you've heard from any of the council members tonight? Is there any, any notes you've made or any response you want to make to that? Well, one, one of the concerns, and when we talk a little bit about time sensitivity, um, <clears throat> is that we've, you know, we've had this area locked down under a moratorium for a while. And what I really want to do is get moving on getting working with the planning and zoning board to start working on some of the zoning code updates and some of the some of the up the form based code implement, uh, updates to to actualize or realize this document so even if if there's a general consensus we know that there's a couple things i know you know i, I think i know where you're lining up when it comes to the west side of uh, of magnolia let me is there any opposition to option 2 well, I would like to add to it the um, second clause of option four, that the boundary of the small area plan revert to the initial boundary as designed in the focus area and original plan as shown to the public in 2021. So if we can put add that clause to option two. I, I have, you, what you could do is to option four, you can just take out the mm. second word, non-residential and third word and support single family attached or detached along the, Marion, the Magnolia Road frontage, retaining the single family detached pattern to the west and the boundary of the small area plan revert to the initial boundary as designed in the focus area. That would, that would accommodate. Uh, that would do it too. Yes. Yeah. Is that understood by members of the council? Yeah. Can you Did say you have that, a question? Send, what are we taking out an option for? You, would take, you would take out non-residential, the, the second and third words. Or single family attached or detached, okay. Yep. Keep the original boundaries. Mm -hmm. yeah. And basically what that does is it, it, is it takes out the non-residential uh, land use. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So council understands that, right? Uh, with that, with that, if there's, if there's no other majors, you know, if you could improve it with that particular option, I can, we can start working and start working actively with the planning and zoning board to implement this yeah. to come up with a regulating plan and some of the standards. I would like to get going mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I we'll get to that point. But <laughs> I just want to offer you the chance. You, you know, there were different comments that some of us made, and and uh, maybe you wanted to have a chance to respond to any of those. Um, I raised some questions. We, I think we all did. Are there any clarifications that we've asked about or problems we might have asked about that you wanted to respond to? No, the only thing I'll look, I'll look at is, is that parallel parking issue along uh, Rattlesnake. And I'm gonna, I'll look at that. I think, that I think that's a very interesting point, actually. I meant to. It wasn't the on entire. That. It wasn't the. I don't. That wasn't the entire length. Let me let me look at that. I'll have a better answer for you. Yeah. It, the concept is when you're looking to provide parking, the concept, and you don't have a lot of parking, <laughs> that is a good concept. So let me let me look at the design configure. Let, let me just look a little bit more into that. Yeah. Because that's something. That, that regardless, north side, that north side of Rattlesnake. A lot of people it has don't a lot like of residential. All those new homes in that area there, right, Patrick? Well, you like parking. Yeah. Um, l l let me look a little bit more into that. That would be something that, is, as we move forward, that's going to be a budgetary expense. It's going to be a capital improvement expense because that's not going to happen on its own. So you know, I, yeah, I have a, some other thing I can talk to you about later. But but I got there's one other thing that I, I 
I just think I want to mention for the sake of the public, because every time I read it, I think to myself, I wonder why they said that. The fiscal analysis that the consultant put in this report, the very last page, literally page 77, it says that, basically it says that residential development generates more money than commercial for the village of Pinehurst. Now, this is after their thorough analysis, I'm going to say, 77 pages, 76 pages worth of product, and the 77th page says uh, residential development generates more than commercial. Now, I realize we shouldn't be doing this for a, uh, to increase our available revenues, but I just find that to be an interesting analysis from the very consultants who are proposing the plan. Well, they were ba that was based on using the 2017 fiscal land use analysis. Thank you. Thanks. The famous fluor. And I, <laughs> all we had to work off of. We with all, with all of its uh, strengths and weaknesses, yeah. Right. Okay. It is just, look, right. we don't, I've, I've said this before, but th no council that I've worked with has ever made a decision based on that. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah. Right. Um, it, it's also helpful to point out that from the county standpoint, it's exactly the opposite. So it is. That's what makes Pinehurst special. County taxpayers. <laughs> okay, I think then we've anticipated uh, any any questions that you were wanted to respond to uh, from the council. I think we raised some interesting points for consideration into the future. Um, I like this thought about Rattlesnake North, and I do think, from my point of view, looking at the way the plan is now and some of the changes that occurred over the last year, that um, Maybe as some else have mentioned, the, you know, the needs of our stakeholders are being met to some degree in here. There's opportunities for perhaps medical um, activity or other things that relate to our major stakeholders. Not that we're trying to solve their problems, but it's good to have a way to meet some of their needs uh, in the way this plan laid out. And I think the same opportunities might exist in uh, Pioneer South as we look at that in the near future. Um, so I was seeing no other questions from the Village Council. Is there a motion? With, and I think we should try to vote on this Thank tonight. Patrick, I, I um, would bow to you. But If you want to read the motion that reflects what uh, the edits we agreed to, I'll be fine with that. Is that what you're, re is that what you're recommending, John? That, uh, yes. That uh, they remove the non-residential aspect? For the yes. Case? Right. Yes. So, so I, would, I would move, if it's, if it's my turn, I, uh, to support single-family attached or detached along the Magnolia Road frontage retaining the single-family detached pattern to the west and the boundary of the small area plan to revert to the initial boundary as designed in the focus area and original plan shown to the public in 2021. That's a motion by uh, Councilmember Hogeman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Pozella. I'll ask the clerk, do you have that change to the motion then? Thank you. Uh, the motion has been seconded. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Opposed. Congratulations. So one opposed. Uh, one opposed and four yes. Is that correct? I did, I'm, I'm four. No, yeah. she said okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Council. I think we've made some good work here tonight. Jeff, or, uh, Darren, you're waving at me here. Yes, no, please. I appreciate that. I just want everybody to know that yes, we've just approved the plan. There's still now. There's some heavy lifting that oh, yeah. we have to do. This is where the Planning and Zoning Board, I need to really work with them, and you'll be part of that process, but let us go and, and work heavily with that board to get this done in a quick time frame. Thank you very much, Darren. Alex, I'm glad that uh, the chair of the Planning and Zoning Board and a couple other members of the board could be here tonight as well. Uh, we'll move to the end of this um, agenda before we go into our work session. Um, hang with me one second. <laughs> Is there any other business that um, is brought to before the village council in this regular meeting? Any other business? All right, we have uh, comments from attendees. Is there a list tonight, uh, Kelly? Excellent. Darren, you have a hot mic.
We have two uh, requests for public comments, one from Philip Sonia and the other from Linda Guerra. Uh, Mr. Sonia, if you are here, would you approach the uh, podium, please? Remind the uh, speakers of our regulations, um, three minutes, please, and uh, I'll have the timer working, but thank you for your comments. Go right ahead, sir. Providing you an update over the last two months. Um, again, my name is Philip Sonia, 29 Bedford Circle. I lived here with my family since uh, 2008. I engage in the short-term property rental discussion um, as my doctoral studies are in public policy along with my focus on property rights. I reviewed all the literature and subject on the, after a significant consultation with public policy planners, economists, academics, and representatives from both sides. I've offered my services to each one of those elements as well. I recommend that we do take an approach that employs voluntary compliance, open, fruitful communication between all parties, leverages third-party oversight, and empowers you, empowers you, the council. The question before us is how can we significantly reduce the negative externalities, and that's traffic, noise violations, poor behavior associated with STRs, through a cooperative approach, while also enabling positive economic development, and most importantly, maintain or improve the character of our resort and residential community. A practical approach to this is results-based management, a procedure used across the world to solve or resolve similar concerns, albeit on a much larger scale there. Uh, results-based management involves having operators. Here are your short-term um, rental owners and managers help craft initial operating procedures, adjust those procedures to include local conditions and neighborhood concerns, employ an independent third party to inspect, audit, and record and compel compliance. <clears throat> this third party then provides a detailed report to the authority, here you, the council, so that the council may either provide or withhold positive support for the properties based on the platforms on which your economic, uh, economic success depends. <clears throat> In a cooperative effort to achieve our mission, to promote, enhance, and sustain the quality of life for residents, businesses, and visitors, as identified by the village, I'm very happy to announce that we secured an initial operating agreement with a number of short-term property owners and managers that meets and exceeds on a number of the measures identified by this councils to address those negative externalities. The initial operating engagement provides third-party oversight on STR properties at no cost to the village with strict annual inspections, digital oversight, proactive community micro-engagements, multiple transparent audible reporting paths for all entities along with transparent, active, <coughs> and quarterly reports to the village council. I briefed this concept to Airbnb, VRBO, and AirDNA. I actually have a 5.15 a.m. meeting with AirDNA on it um, tomorrow morning. It's in comport with their cooperative vision to proactively engage communities, neighbors, and operators to reduce those negative externalities and improve relationships at all levels, while more importantly, in rewarding those property owners and managers that are cooperating with their communities, neighbors, and local leadership. So what does that third party do? Drafts the general guidelines for all STR properties in comport with the village, engage neighbors at the individual levels, levels to incorporate micro concerns, <coughs> opens communication with neighbors in an open house and community engagement, provides neighbors with a sequenced multimedia contact plan, <coughs> records all concerns and communicates to them, property owners, managers, neighbors, and villages to ensure compliance, provides quarterly reports to the council along with reviewable up to the minute metrics, receives the council approval for positive reinforcement and communicates a council decision through platforms. Their, their payment path platforms are the most effective ways to, to affect that system. Why would you want to do it? Because it's compliance paid for by the STR property owners. Rewarding those that comply through the platforms that they depend on requires no additional staff within the village. Your greatest cost sustains property revenue growth, our greatest revenue, provides 24 seven auditable repository complaints and commendations at no cost again to the village, retains the council's de facto authority without costly legal entanglement, leverages not only neighbors, but more importantly, STR managers to enforce compliance. You know, I recognize we're a resort residential community, and this provides a mechanism to address the media concerns at the lowest cost and greatest revenue, <coughs> I'm sorry, while providing hard data to make an informed decision in the future. Thank you. Mr. Sonia, thank you very much. And to both uh, the speakers tonight, I'll just remind you, uh, we'd be very happy to have those comments in writing submitted to the village clerk directly to the village clerk, if you wish. Uh, Linda Guerra, present? Yes, hi, Linda. Hi, uh, 
Hi, I'm Linda Guerra, 15 McQueen Road in Pinehurst. I've been sitting here tonight and listening to lots of discussion on this Pinehurst Place area and the concern you have shown for separating single family residences from commercial. Yet I woke up one day and I had a Motel 6 next to me. I still don't know how it happened. I'm hoping that the concern you're showing for future building in Pinehurst that you show for us residents that have been here. I've been here 23 years. Every time my family comes and they look next door, they want me to sell my house. So I am depending on you to think about the residents that are here now. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other persons who wish to speak tonight, even if you did not sign up? Yes, sir. Anybody else? Good evening, Jeff Heinz, 225 Lake Forest Drive, Southwest in Pinehurst. <clears throat> um, I'm speaking with respect to the remarks of Mr. Sonia. I was unaware that he had uh, his proposal put together. Uh, and to the extent I was able to follow it, I guess I would try to avoid the, the feeling that we've never done something in, in a particular way before, so we shouldn't do it that way now. But you have and our citizens have for the last six months come to this building every two weeks to talk about short-term rentals. And now tonight, as you enter your work session, you will for the first time be on the cusp of taking concrete action that will assist your residents, our citizens, in dealing with this issue. I urge you not to be deterred from that based on an undefined and um, unknown voluntary compliance program paid for, brought to you by the short-term rental operators. I suggest to you with respect that if you allow that to proceed, You'll get what you pay for. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any, any other persons who wish to speak tonight? Seeing none, we'll close the uh, public comments. And uh, that will lead us to a motion to adjourn for this uh, regular meeting and move into the work session. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn the regular meeting and move to the work session? Move to adjourn the regular meeting. That's a motion by Lydia Bosch. Is there a second? Second. Uh, mm -hmm. Second by Pat Pozella. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, we'll move to the work session at uh, 7.05.